Ladies and gentlemen, what's up? What's up? This is your host, Questlove of Questlove Supreme. How y'all been doing? I hope y'all been doing fine. Um, so we're doing it a little bit different this year. Um, we're recording some special QLS episodes this season. And in order for you guys to get more familiar with anyone on this show who's not me, uh, which is always a good thing, in my opinion, um, I decided that I wanted each member of the Supreme team to get their own uh, rogue episode and interview <laughs> and do sort of a one on one ish. Um, and we kicked it off, of course, with Sugar Steve with his dream interview, uh, his epic two part conversation with Elvis Costello. And they recorded at Electric Lady Studios, um, one of the first in person QLS uh, episodes since the pandemic yeah. back in March of 2020. So this particular go round, uh, we are passing the microphone, if you will, to our brother Fontigolo. Fontigolo, what's up, man? Yes, indeed. What's up, man? Congratulations. It's our first one since uh right since, since the big win, man. Everything. That's everything right. Changed. <laughs> yes, everything. <laughs> the price is going up. No, I'm playing. Yeah. <laughs> but today's but price <laughs> is not today's, today's price. price. I love it. Yeah. So similar uh, to Sugar Steve, Fonte's guest uh, is a gentleman uh, that he has worked closely with, actually, that I've actually collaborated with as well. Um, and this particular Questlove Supreme guest is none other than Mr. Eric Roberson. And he's Grammy-nominated singer, songwriter, producer, and music industry OG. And um, I just want to welcome him. Please welcome him to Questlove Supreme. What's up, Eric? Uh, honor to be on here, man. Congratulations as well. First chance to get to tell you that. Uh, appreciate y'all having me on here. Thank you. Hella je jealous of your background right now. <laughs> yeah, his, his Zoom, I think it's only second to Will Smith's Zoom. Like yes, exactly. Mom, like, <laughs> like you. Will, Will Zoom was like, that shit looked like HDTD. Yeah, you look yeah. like you're in the Garden of Eden right now. Like, what does this represent, this particular background? This this background is part of just my basement <laughs> and what I've learned during the pandemic, man. I was doing virtual shows. I teach class sitting here as well. Uh, I got I got sound effects and, and all kind of, you know, all kind of stuff here. Just, uh, you know, applause I love and, it. you know, whatever we need. Yeah. To do. Yeah. Before. So before you got on, before you came on, with me, he was talking to us and he's going to be the one to kind of help us get roll call back. Cause he got some tools. Yeah. You know how apps. to deal with it. No latency. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so there's several different things that we can get fixed, but yes, I told Laia, let's, let's talk And Tim. Cause I, when the first pandemic started, the first thing I started doing, I made an album, but the second thing I did was like, how do we do shows? And then I probably spent shout out to my boy, DJ Mosky in LA, probably about a month or two months staying up all night just trying to all those things figure out latency figure out like looping things back like playing things from a computer hearing it and then sending it back into the web uh, all that stuff man we, we crashed and burned on it so yeah let's let's talk after afterwards i, I got you forget the interview let's talk now <laughs> <laughs> now i'm gonna leave y'all to it uh again thank you very much for doing this and uh hit it fonte yes Pleasure. sir all right Yo, all right, man. So listen, though, like I'm sitting here and as much as we work together, there are just very, I think, crucial things in your life that me and you have never talked about. That's crazy. Like when we like when we when we was on the phone the other day after the Fred Hammond interview and you were telling me about like what commission meant to you and like how mm. something as simple as just seeing gospel singers on an album cover with jeans on. Yeah. You know, for yeah. for you know, for a heathen like me, that was nothing, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but um, but nah, man. Um, yeah, talk about you know how you got started. Like, what was your first kind of introduction into music? Well, my dad plays guitar and sings. Uh my sister, I have an older sister, my sister Alicia, love you, Lee. And um, and you know, I think that all my introduction really started from that, just being a little brother had to follow her around, and she was the one who actually had a band in high school. And she did theater and was making clothes and all kind of so whatever she was doing is the little brother. I went to the piano lessons. I went to 
dance recitals. I went to the theater classes, went to her band rehearsals. And um, I think a lot of it just rubbed off on me. Of course, we sing in the church on Sunday. We got choir mm-hmm. rehearsal two days out the week or whatever, youth choir, emergency choir, whatever we was, whatever choir we were in. And of course, then of course, you know, we we boom bapping on the on the cafeteria table with our friends, freestyle rhyming, dreaming of being UTFO or whoever. So I mean, <laughs> was, you know, I mean, I'm from Jersey. It's just like a there was so many different things that we were into. So when it came, you were born in Rahway, quick. Rahway. I was born, I was born in I was born in Newark, but I was raised in Rahway. Yeah, raised Rahway, Rahway, Jersey. Gotcha. And um, and I think just when it came time to do music, like what do you do? Like you know, it's like do you do gospel music? Do you do house music? Do you do rap? Do you do R and B? Do you, do, well, you know, I, I was really struggling with that. But I will tell you that, you know, several moments that was really impactful for me. I remember when like going through my dad's vinyl and realized that this was somebody's job. Like somebody, like, they do this for a living. Like I remember taking a Stevie Wonder record. Like so he wrote this stuff and like he called, he put this together. Like oh, okay, this is a job. I couldn't even tell you how old I was, but I remember that being really impactful. Like I know my dad goes to work. This person goes to work and they do this. They do, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and my dad would come home and pick the guitar, but we had a guitar like in every room, you know. Um, but with did your dad, did he have personal? Did, did he have like aspiration of being a professional musician, or was it just like a hobby, just something he did? For just fun? a hobby, just a relief, just really. I think when my dad. And my dad was kind of late in joining church. When he joined, he joined. You know, <laughs> he became a powerhouse in that in that church as a vocalist. Me, my whole family was in the church before, mind you. My grandfather's a pastor. My dad's brothers were pastors. My my mom's brothers were all deacons. So I think everyone had yeah. found church before my dad. My dad was very reluctant. <laughs> when he found it, boy, he he found it. You know. <laughs> And, and I remember uh, you telling me, I think, isn't like some of your people, I think is your grandfather, like, don't you have some ties in North Carolina? I think I either, oh, yeah, I feel like my, either your mom or dad told me this. My mom and dad, my mom and dad are both from uh, from North Carolina. Yeah, so a town called Greenville and a little town called Stokes is where uh, wow. you know, my family, wow. my family, Greenville, North Carolina, and Stokes, North Carolina, you know. So, um, yeah, and everybody's still there. For the most part, I had, you know, some family on my mom's side move up north when, when my when my parents relocated, um, came up north and some of that. But for the most part, most of my family's in North Carolina. Yeah, so when I first heard commission, man. we won, um, I think my parents got a, a tape, a commission tape from the family reunion. <laughs> and and uh, I remember I was ironing my clothes and I put the tape in. I was like, oh, let me just put this tape and listen to some music. I didn't know what it was, right? I, I, I didn't even catch the album cover yet. But I remember um, I was ironing my clothes and I just looked down and, and, and my clothes were wet. Like there was drops of wetness on my, <laughs> on my clothes. And I didn't realize I had started crying on my clothes. I'm probably like 12. 11 12 13 years old and the music was like punching me in the chest like you literally was punching me in the chest i remember this day like it was yesterday i remember i saying whatever that is like point at the point at the radio like whatever that is i want to do that like i want to do whatever that is because it was the most impactful moment and from that moment on i was like all right learn everything i can about commission learn everything i can about who's this fred hammond guy i'll learn everything i can about him and uh and then like i said you know up to that point just keeping really 100 you know, a young kid growing up in church, you had an excuse when you see, I'm not even gonna, I was about to name church, church people that might not have came off so cool. They sounded great, but they didn't come off yeah. so cool. They were know? always like three, four years behind what exactly. was going so on. So you were like, music. okay, you you heavy in the church because you kind of corny. You, know, you, can't, you can't be in the club. So maybe that's why mm. you, that's why you singing this. Cause clearly if you wasn't as corny, maybe you'd be singing with Guy right. and audition and singing. <laughs> and the commission came out and they had Gumby's and jeans on. They look like, they look fly. And I was like, mm-hmm. why are they singing this? There must be something impactful to them. Plus it already kind of blew me away and stuff like that. And it was, it was, it was a really monumental thing, but it really more strengthened my pen game. It made me say, like really write something true that could be penetrating to somebody. And I think that was the first, like first time I got on that course of doing that. Man, man I want to uh, talk to you or I wanted you to talk about uh, your parents. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. you know, me and you, we've been, you know, we go back, God, I mean, shit, it's almost 20 years at this point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, um, you know, man, your parents, you know, I, I just in the time that we work together and I will always see 
your parents always there, like supporting you, helping you, you know what I mean? Um, pulling up at shows. Your dad, and I don't even know if we ever talked about this. I know I've never talked about this publicly, but the day that we shot the picture perfect video, when we shot the picture perfect video in, in Brooklyn, yeah, I don't even know if me and you ever talked about this. This is one of the worst days of my life. <laughs> 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 we have not talked about this <laughs> oh wow okay we have not. okay bro listen so that morning i flew into philly and then because we were shooting in brooklyn so i flew into philly and your dad came and picked me up from the airport so this is like oh god maybe we shot it on like a let's say we shot it on like a friday or something i don't know but anyway we shot it on a friday and literally i think that tuesday that was when my divorce started. Mm. That was when like me and my, you know, pre we separated. So the day of that picture perfect video shoot, I am a fucking wreck. <laughs> I, I do not, I, I, as, far, as much as I had, as much as I wanted to do it. And as, you know, as much as I love everybody involved, man, that shit was a wreck. But I was riding in the car with your dad. Your dad came and picked me up from the airport. And then he uh, took us to Brooklyn to where the shoot was. And so we were sitting in the car, bro. And, um, you know, and, and your dad is, I mean, pops is pops. He just, hey, what's yeah. going on, young man? What's happening? Let's, let's talk about, it. you know, he's just on. Yeah. And I just broke down crying. And wow. he was just like, yo, he's like, man, you all right? And I'll never forget this. I asked him, I said, I said, Pop, I said, look, I, I just got to ask you, man. I said, you know, have you ever, you know, thought of a time where, can you, do you ever remember uh you ever thought you know in all your years of you know being married you ever thought that like marriage maybe wasn't for you and he was like he said oh that's strong he said that's tough right there <laughs> I that. he was like, <laughs> why you got him down to a science is amazing <laughs> bro i never forget this shit long as i lived dog. so i was like damn he's like oh that's tough right there and i'll never get he gave me some of the most like timeless just most perfect advice that has been just like a guiding light, you know, for everything, you know what I mean? Just in my career and just, you know, whenever I have to make tough decisions. And he just said, he said, well, listen, man, he said, look, no matter what you choose, no matter what decision you make, it's going to be the right decision because it's your decision. <laughs> God, Lee, <laughs> no matter Dog. what decision you make, it's going to be the right decision because it's your decision. Because it's your decision. That sounds so much like that, man. <laughs> Bro, so yeah, so that was so that was my life was changed in like an hour and a half ride with this guy. What impact did your parents have on your? You'll speak to their impact on you as an so artist. First of all, why why did you fly to Phil? Why did you fly in Philly when we shot in New York? I think I can't remember what it was. I think we were because I think your if I'm not mistaken, I think your parents were bringing your clothes or something. They had to drive up to Brooklyn anyway. Okay. So yeah. I think it just made sense. It was like, all right, just flying to Philly and I'll just ride up with Pops. I think that was the logic. If but, I you know, right. even before I even answer your question, the interesting thing is maybe the reason why you flew into Philly is because you needed that time to have that conversation. I mean, 100 percent. We know you that know, was the real it's, reason. It's amazing how things but, work out. But, <laughs> you know, it's first of all, I've been very fortunate to have the most amazing parents in the entire world, just the most supportive. Uh, supportive parents from day one to just even today you know what i mean like just really um and that answer is so funny i always joke to say that my dad has never given me a straight answer ever in life right my dad is always, <laughs> so when i walk to my dad i'm like you know heartbroken i would say dad but did you ever go through whatever his answers are usually that that answer is so him whatever decision you make is going to be the right decision because it's your decision right so so for example my dad's a junior and he was hell bent on making sure I wasn't the third reason why he's like, yo, I need you to go your own path. I need go you to your own, way. your own way. And so if I ever said like, dad, you like this outfit? He'd be like, do you like the outfit? <laughs> right? He's like, he'd never, he'd never just go, yeah, it's dope. I do it my entire time of knowing my dad. Not one time. Dad, you like this hat? I love the hat. Keep rocking. He'd be like, dad, you like this hat? Are you wearing it? How's it make you feel? You know, I love you. <laughs> going to wear the hat then, right? It's like, what that in the fox. world? But what I did notice is that throughout my life, when I go back and like reflect back on the life, he would never give me an answer. He'll never give me a direction, but he was always like, little nudge. Okay, he's a little off. 
Mm. Stay close. No answer, but nudging back again. Just, like it was just, just like putting up putting up guardrails. Putting yeah. up guardrails throughout my entire life, through all the failed record deals, throughout, you know, the tough times trying to struggle, going back to college and and, and whatever. And my mom was more like the I remember when I had um, left school, you know, I did the Warner Brothers thing and I went to mm. Island Records and I was out of school for like a year and a half. And my mom was like, so what's up with the record deal? And I was like, I, I, I think it kind of dried up. She's like, so you know, you got your scholarship still, right? You need to go to a building like, <laughs> listen. So I went, I went there the next time and they, they didn't like offer the scholarship. They were like, I was like, my, I went back. And it was like, they were like, nobody was like bringing it back up. She said, you need to go in there, you need to sing. You need to sign sign autographs. You need to hug every single person. And you need to do whatever you need to do. But when you walk out of that A building, that scholarship needs to be back. And I was like, okay, cool. I, I walked back. There, I love you to the moon. I walked in like, hey, you know, what I mean? right, right. You need, you need a picture. You need a hug. You need me to sing at your bar mitzvah. Whatever. It's like you know, a meet and greet. Yeah. So she was the one. She she'll be the one who's like, you know, I'm gonna give you some direction. This is what you need to do. You know, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever. And, and they were the perfect. They're the perfect. Um, I tell you the the two most impactful moments in my my childhood. My mom, when I was uh, I think a freshman in high school, I remember her coming home, and she had quit her corporate America job. I think she worked for AT and T, and she was like, "I can't do it no more. I'm done. I'm so un- I'm just unfulfilled. I'm done with it." I remember he wasn't talking to us; she was talking to my dad, and he was like, "Okay, all right, cool." And she had quit her job to start a business in fashion. Wow, and. That was really important. Like I own my own business. My sister owns her own business now. And I think it comes from that day. Entrepreneurship. My mom. Yeah, exactly. But then the other part was, I think like the next day, my dad had this Lincoln Mach 7, white with a blue rag top, sweet, gorgeous car. And the next day he put a for sale sign on it. Mm. And it sold within hours. Like somebody drove by, bought it like boom. And he went and bought this big old, old gray van to drive my mom's clothes around. So it was like the moments of entrepreneurship and then like support your partner. Yeah, you know nah, true sacrifice and support. Yeah, that's real. And, and I think, you know, I think I'm an example of entrepreneurship, but at the same time, you know, I, my, if you, anybody knows me and my wife, it's like, it, that's how we, I'm driving, she holding the map. She driving, <laughs> holding the map. Like, all right, this the turn, you know what I mean? So I'm constantly trying to figure out what's the gray van in my marriage, you know what I mean? And, and doing that. And I, and it's, it's, whole, it's completely, watching watching my parents watching my parents you know my I, 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 you know i give everything to them you know what i mean it's enormously supportive what i'll tell you my dad you know if you know him he goes by pop everybody calls him pop and most of my friends unfortunately did grow up with dads you that know is. for whatever reason whatever <laughs> and my dad was not just my dad my dad was the dad to my community to nah, all my up. So it's like he nah, earned up. he earned that term pop. Like to not just in high school, not even just college, but then all the bands that played from all the musicians that played from me just all the times, all the cats he picked up from the airport and who might have been going through a hard time. Yo, he's he's like for real, if anyone's ever earned that term pop, you know, it's one thing to be a dad, you know, and he's been a great dad to me, but he's been mm-hmm. a pop to like the music community. Like they, these stories I hear all the time because he's taking time to invest in everybody. And what's crazy is they live 10 minutes down the street from me. People will go see them. I call my <laughs> dad. They go see you? Yeah, yeah, so, so I'm like, they ain't call. What? <laughs> they, no, they come to see Pop. They come to get mama's cook. They come to see Pop. You know what I mean? And I, and I think that, that speaks volumes, you know, for how amazing they are. Yeah, man. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, one of the things that we that I noticed when we first started working together, um, particularly when we would do videos together, like we did Picture Perfect and then we did We Are On The Move and, you know, stuff. You have a very much uh, uh, kind of like a, a, the, a theater presence, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you, the thing I, I noticed when we would work is in videos like you use your whole body, like you use your hands, you use your leg, like you do, like, I was like, okay, he's like really a performer. And um, one of the first times we went, we did a show together. And I just remember at the end of the show, I was just sitting on the side watching. And at the end of the show, he was like, you know, you're like, yo, my name is Eric Robeson. And it has been my great um, honor to perform for you tonight. 
And yeah. that is just something that it, that really resonated with me. And I, and I, you know, I never forgot that because it's, it's something that I think a lot of artists don't really take and understand the importance of giving a performance, you know what I'm saying? Of, of using the stage as uh, you know, as your place to really perform and express yourself and give the audience an experience. And um, I have to think that a lot of that came from your experience in Howard uh, in their musical theater department. And I just wanted to, you know, you touch on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I because my sister, I grew up doing theater, really got heavy into it in like junior high and high school. And then um, I got a scholarship to Howard and going to my parents saying, hey, I want to, I want to, if I could have majored in r and I would have majored in R&B, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> if I could have majored in commission, I would have majored as this right, right. <laughs> But that, obviously that didn't exist. So there was a musical theater major. I went and saw a performance of Dream Girl before I, before I ever went to okay. Howard. And I was blown away by like, just the talent there. I was like, oh, I got to get it together. And um, I'll tell you, it was, a, it was a blessing going, you know, first of all, I was around just killers. The, the, the teachers were great. The students were great. Just you saw the future of theater, the future of acting, the future of everything in that in that department. The third floor was the music department. The first floor was the theater department. Mm-hmm. And I probably learned more about music on the first floor in theater because theater was talking about like character development and like, you know, if you say, but it's true. Well, what is true mean? What is true to you? And we might talk 10 minutes about just the word true. So let's back it up. What's the first time you ever heard true? Where were you at the first time you ever heard that word? Oh, I heard it when I was in kindergarten. Okay, was it true then? And then, you know, it's like the teachers would dissect it. Now say it again. Now you're like, so is it true? Before I could even say it, tears fall on my, I mean, it was like dissecting it. So of course, <laughs> now you talk about like, trying to write songs and things like that. What if I bring this into that area? What if I bring theater into these? It's all us as singers and rappers, we're just characters. The songs are just scripts. You know, yeah. I mean, the music is just the scenery. The stage is a scene. It's like, you know what I mean? So it's like, how can we bring this to a, another, another level? And for me, whether it's in the studio, whether it's on stage, whatever, yeah, it's like, how can we bring this, this character? Not, not just that, if I'm sad, the bass player need to be sad. Mm. I can't, I can't be pouring my We all got to be telling the same story. Yeah, we all got to be telling the same story. So the drummer can't be happy like, cat, cat, cat. and I'm going <laughs> to sit here like, how could you let me down or, or vice versa, you know? Mm. So I think, um, I think a lot of my friends from Howard are surprised I didn't follow a career in theater, but, but when I also feel like I fulfill my, my, my theater needs in my music, in my writing, and in my performance as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think the choice, a lot of it came from my desire to write. Like, sure, if in theater, I would have been re- auditioning and then rehearsing and probably not doing my own material. I'll be taking on other characters with this one. I was like, I could, I could write about, you know, I could really dive into it. And it, and it worked. I think when people listen to even to my music, if not every most song, you're gonna find a song on every album where it's like it's musical theater. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh it's yeah, like, nah. You had you was a record. I forgot which album it was on. It was called the the magician. I think where magician. you like was speaking from the aspect of magician. I was just like, man, I would never do a song like that. I would be so scared to do a record Why? <laughs> like that. Oh, I don't know. It's just I, I was. <laughs> I just thought it was just a really brave choice. But you always took those kind of choices where you would really like embody a character. I mean, it's one thing to rap as that character, right? It's one thing to be yeah. slick Rick and like, you know, you know, the cop shot the kid, you know, to, like to do all yeah. the voices. But you don't really see that in in R and B as as singers. And I, I always thought that was a. Uh, really admirable and just always admired you for taking those kind of choice those kind of chances in your stuff i appreciate it i appreciate it yeah. well you know i learned i learned a lot from your pen you know if i, I and I even say this you know i the first time i ever witnessed it a person writing a song without writing it down was watching you uh when we oh, did wow. been in love and remember well, we love. yes indeed so we did been in love you were having a conversation with my dad i was setting the music up and my dad was talking and you took my dad's conversation Remember this day like it was yesterday, the exact conversation <laughs> and you made it rhyme and you, you were like, the beat was ready. And he was like, yeah, I'm ready. And then you just walked in and took everything that y'all were talking about and just rhymed it down. I, it blew me away that somehow you processed all that in your head without putting it on paper. And it took me some time, but you know, probably I haven't written a song down probably for the last 10 years, probably like, you know, so a lot of it is like, seeing what you did of course hearing what biggie's doing and hearing jay-z but then seeing what you did 
And then for me applying like theater background, for me, I, my first thing is like, all right, who do I want to be in the song? What's the character? The more, the more developed the character is, then I just hit record. Cause now I just gotta make it rhyme. I, the, the objective is all there. The character's all there. And then, and then just make it rhyme. But I, but a lot of it was sparked from like watching you do it. I was like, that's so crazy. Man. I was like, yo, did this cat just literally, <laughs> first, of, first of all, not only just that, did you wrote a song in your head, but you wrote a song in your head while talking to somebody. That's yeah, crazy. I mean, yeah. I mean, that was just, that was again, just your pop, man. Like that was pop. So he just, you know, would just come in and just drop these jewels and he just start talking and <laughs> all right, young man, well, tell me about, let me talk to you about this. And he just be talking. I'm just soaking this shit in. I'm like, man. And so I just went in and did it. And the crazy stuff now is like kind of the roles are reversed because you don't write down and I'm constantly like writing prompts, like in my phone. Like, um, I, I think, I think for me, what changed was the process because at that time we did been in love, man. That was shit. That was damn old. Yeah. Five, six, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so at that time, that's when we were recording at the studio. And so that was just kind of my process. I would just turn the beat on, just crank it up. And I would just walk around pace just kind of just, you know, run it in my head, just kind of write the verse in my head with the music up. But then around like, oh, nine, that was when, um, and it's in the studio, it's in, we're in some, we're in a studio. So, you know, time is money. We just want to be efficient. So that was how we learned just in those early little brother records. It's like, all right, get in, get out. You know what I'm saying? We just had to be, you had to be on it. So right. around like, oh, nine, once we moved back to when I built my studio at the crib, you know, I mean, my kids are here. I can't be just cranking shit at three in the morning. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so my process changed. And so that was when I kind of had to go back to just like actually writing either on paper or, you know, sometimes my phone or whatever, but just going there. And so from the time when we were working at first, it just, my whole thing was just like one take. I got to get it down. It's just one take, one take Jake. Mm -hmm. That's what it's got to be. But um, once I got home and uh, talking to another co-collaborator of ours, Feral Monch, uh, talking to him and he had a completely different approach and he would say he said man when i go to the booth i treat it like i'm a director you know what i'm saying he said so i look at my verse like okay i'll do a take but it's like hmm the and in that verse i may want to stick that better because that'll lend and i'll just go in and get just the and you know what i mean like he is surgical with this shit, you know what I'm saying? And yeah, yeah. hearing that approach, I was like, oh my God, you know what I mean? And so that was kind of where I'm at with it now. It's much more, uh, uh, a lot more kind of methodical. Yeah. First of all, you know, I, listen, this can, you already know, you know what I'm saying? You, you know, like, with a hand down, when it comes to pins, you know, Man, you already ahead. know what I, what I think. Go ahead. Look, if, if I put my money on anybody, and, and you know, fair <laughs> much, much as well, and I'm honored to Oh, man, come on, much well. is, much is God. Come on, what are we talking but about? You, you know, just such a, you, you've always had such a unique approach, and it's so interesting, but I, like I said, the process changes. I'm a, I'm a fan of people's, pro process is one of my favorite words in the entire mm -hmm. world. You're gonna hear me say it several times, even in this interview, but, I can't, and people always ask me like, who would you love to collaborate? I say, I'd love, I just love to watch. I love just being in a room when Farrell Monch is working mm -hmm. or when Erica Badu is working or when Fonte's working, like just so I can see the process of how somebody's putting something together. It's always amazing. And it, guess what? It always works differently for different people. And it's people. always different. That's the thing. Everybody's thing is different, man. And yeah. it's just, yeah, I remember like, you know, when we were working and you know, and I would see just kind of, you know, because you would I would tune into the process like your your, you know, your your platform. And I was just again, it was just one of those things, you know, for 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 people listening, you know, Arrow, he has a uh, thing. Is it still on Patreon? Is it still you still on Patreon? Yeah, with yeah. Or, yeah. yeah uh, called yeah. the process where, you know, um, he pretty much just Netflix himself. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? But he was ahead of the curve. You, I mean, you did this shit down there 10 years ago. <laughs> but, um, you know, but he has a, a thing called The Process where you can just tune in and watch him create songs. And that is just, again, just one of those things where I'm just like, dude, I would never, like, never, like, oh my God, like having cameras in the studio while I'm like, bro, that is, yo, I would rather you have a camera in the dressing room while I'm like trying on sweatpants or some shit. Like, a right, camera right. in the studio while I'm creating. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, oh, like I just, oh, I just, I can't do what? it, bro. I just, it freaks me out. 
it, I learned this quickly, which you, yeah, you, me and you have done a million songs, but when we decided to do the <laughs> album, right? When we did the Man, Tigalero album, it was, it was very obvious to me, okay, I am one who wants to go through it to figure it out. You're one who wants to figure it out before you go through it. It was to, to me facts. exact. We were, we, we, we were so exact opposite that we actually were the same in some form mm-hmm. fashion, right? Mm-hmm. And it compl- mm-hmm. it worked out, it complimented, but it was like, you know, I'm definitely one who's like, put cameras on me. Like, I'll do what, like, I'm down to like, just throw it against the wall, like, whatever. And you like, nah, bro, we ain't throwing nothing against the wall. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm going to build the wall. Shots. I got 10 bullets. Hell yeah. <laughs> 10 bullets, and, 10 and, to, the yeah, it, to the head. <laughs> and I think to a degree, you know, I maybe I was able to pull you a bit off center. That's a, a, I, absolutely. I had, a, I had this beautiful thing about the conversation about collaboration, how amazing the, the collaboration it is. But it's like you were able to pull me off center, and I was able to pull you off center, and it, that's where the magic of all that, you know, laid at right there. But yet we had we definitely had two different type of. Um, theories when we came in to do that album, you know what I mean? Of just, uh, of just how, how it worked. And I immediately realized, oh, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> Stop throwing stuff against the wall. Cause this is not, that's not going to work. He's, he's not going to understand. Like, it's, no, he's like, not nah, homie. We, we ain't just throwing stuff against the wall. Like, no, we planning out our shots and we're going 10 for 10. It's going to be 10 for 10. Listen, you know? man, listen. No, nah, it was so informative because I just had never, because I had, I was never that person that, you know, and I always admired, you know, that, and that was something working with you, it, in a lot of ways, it kind of reminded me of working with Pooh, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And, and LB, because Pooh was like that coming up. Like Pooh was the guy that Pooh would just record nonstop. He would just go in and just bang, bang, rap gang. And he was way more prolific than I was. And, you know, that was something that I always admired, you know what I mean? Because I just was never like that. It just always felt like I was wasting people's time. I'm like, yo, if I ain't really coming with no heat, like, I'm going to just shut the fuck up because I ain't, you know what I mean? I just ain't. I ain't trying to be out here just experimenting. Like when I show up, I want it to be for real. And so we were working on that album. First off, you know, for everybody listening at home, to this day, I have no idea how we finished that record. Um, no idea. That was at the time, because I think you were, were you about to have your third son at that time? Or had he just been born? He had, he had just been born. So we, had, so, so me and Fine decided we we're going to make an album. And we had been talking for about two years about planning Straight to do up. it. You waited till you went on tour <laughs> and then you called me. I remember, the, I remember the phone call. You said, E, I'm ready. Let's start. Let's start. The t- it, we, at that point, we weren't even calling Tigalero yet. We didn't call Tigalero yet. Yeah, we didn't have a title. Let's start the album. And I said, Oh, that's that's great. I'm in the hospital. My <laughs> wife just had a baby. <laughs> and you was kind of like, That's dope, but this is the window. Like, this is the window. Like, this is the time. And I was like, literally holding the child like okay if this is the window then let's go now mind you you know to help out one thing this is my third child in you know in probably six years so we, we were having a child like ten, first yeah, of all, y'all was having stair step kids we had a yeah. little little break i uh, see like a three-year break and then we had another child right and so i've been recording with kids in my hand you know like for the last mm-hmm. seven years, pretty much mm-hmm. last five years, whatever. So I was, you know, okay, all right, cool. But literally the next, like two days later, we were, we were cutting. And I mean, yeah. 90% of that record was cut literally with that kid, like ho- hold him. I said it in one of the songs. Mm-hmm. It's so easy. Literally it's like yeah. So we were like, but then you were like, you, like I said, you were in a different state. I feel like he was in a different state every time you send me something. We at no point we would ever we didn't see each other. Nah, so what's crazy? It, it was like straight foreign exchange more, style, bro. Like it was straight completely. up. Completely, even the album cover, everything was just hilarious how it all came <laughs> together. But yet, but yet, as locked in, we could not have been any more locked in. And I think that's the that's the magic of it, you know. I think which is which is really really special. When I go back and listen to those songs, you know, they were they were amazing. I mean, it was a blur. Because it was really crazy. A total blur. Yeah. But that record, I, man, Liz, I mean, that record made me just a better musician all the way around. Just, you know, better singer, songwriter, because it was just, it was very much for me, it was just a thing of just kind of iron sharpening iron. And, you know, I'm, I've just always just been a believer in, you know, when you're collaborating with people that you respect, 
you know, you just always want to, you, you want to be on your best behavior, so to speak. You know, you always yeah. want to make sure you show up as the best because, you know, I knew like you just had a kid, um, 2016, that was when, um, yeah, I lost my dad and my man. Yeah. The night we did, um, I think the night we did Atlanta, um, it was like shortly after that. I can't re remember. It was, this was 20, it's 2016. Um, but yeah, uh, I lost like my, 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 granddad died on like Tuesday and then yes. my dad yeah. died on like Sunday and yeah. all of this shit was happening while we we're in the middle of the record. You know what I'm saying? And so I knew that you were showing up. I'm like, he just had a kid. Like I got through what I'm going through, but man, fuck this. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm staying in this. We're going to finish this, you know? And, uh, and I always admired just, you know, your efficiency um, just because I knew working with you. I'm like, I, I know this will get done. I know to get done. And yeah, I just always, you know, wanted to just maintain that trust. It's like, yo, if Errol send me something, he knows is is I'm knocking it out and it's over with. Yeah, we we have, I mean, we've had a great relationship over music. It was a, it was it was time, and we of course <laughs> we showed up with we showed at the right time, but it was it was the craziest time for that us was crazy to, to, to do an album. But you know what? It worked out. You know, it's even funny though, like the the whole we, how we Tigalero, we said that as a joke, as a joke, right? <laughs> For like, that was the way we send it to each other. Tigal, I, I cut a verse back. Tigalero, Lero, and then you and you send a verse back. Tigal, and eventually was like, that joint kind of sounds like. Album. Album. <laughs> like, why you bullshitting? This, this that actually go, might bro. be uh, that actually might be the next, you know. So listen, man. But once again, that was the happy medium of like. Going through it to see if it works and see mm -hmm. if it works, see if it works before we go through it. We, we kind of like, you know, because at no point we was committing, we were just having fun. But eventually it was like, that tickle out kind of job. It actually yeah. kind of work a little I'm like, bit. I'm not tired of it. I'm like, I keep saying it. You know what I mean? I'm like, this might be it. So fun time. Uh, I want to uh, I want to ask you, man. Um, so back to your your days at Howard and your first deal on uh on Warner Brothers um I first off you have no idea how excited I was to find out that you wrote the moon that the moon was your song oh, I wow. mean the moon was I mean man the moon was one of those songs that I literally remember hearing it one time on the radio when I was probably like I don't know 12 or 13 or something and I was like oh my god like who the fuck is this this shit is amazing <laughs> and never heard it again and so then you know I mean you know 15 however many years later I'm like oh yeah. shit you know what I mean um yeah. what, how did you get that uh that Warner Brothers deal what was that process like of signing with them so my sophomore year uh the group Shy who also was Howard mm -hmm. um they had a big song. So they, they met a DJ, a real DJ, right. And they sung the song for him two weeks, a week later, they were on the radio with him. Two weeks later, they were on Arsenio Hall. Two weeks after that, they were millions of copies later, you know, it just went, it just it, it exploded. And it, and it was crazy because all of us were singing and doing stuff on, on campus, but we were, at that point, I was just trying to be the dopest on campus. I didn't even mm -hmm. think this could be something outside of this. And that was big, but the bigger part of it was also like, what, here's my demo. Like, just when you get to LA, um just pass it to somebody and you and these were the songs that you had recorded previously before yeah just, just like my, my demo at that time my demo at that time which uh, was just i want to say the moon was probably on it no no that's not true let me think for a second no so all right so derek who was a member of uh of shy carl okay. i'm sorry was a member of shy introduced me to his brother his brother was okay. managing the group and he had some producers that were under Teddy Riley and they sent okay. me the track. And that's when I wrote, wrote, wrote the moon. And then of course the phones at that point, at that point now I'm doing class and every weekend I'm pretty much like flying out to uh, take meetings and stuff. Met wow. with Biddy Medina, met with Lil Siles before he passed and uh -huh. um, just running past label at the label at the label. And what then, was Lil Silas like, man? He's this very time, you know, we don't really, we get few people on here that have worked with him, but what was he like? He was the guy uh, for everyone listening. Lil Silas Jr. was the he was the guy over at uh, MCA Records. Um, yep. You know, he played the you know big role. You know, New Edition. Uh, he formed Silas Records, like Shante Moore, Shante Moore uh, yep. Aaron. Like he was he was kind of one of the one of the OGs of this. What was he like? I just had one meeting with him, but I remember he was shooting straight from the hip. What I remember from him was he said, uh, and this was interesting because when I look back. Um, 
So he's like, uh, listen, man, I just want to take a meeting with you. I think you already decided, you know, you're going to do the Warner Brothers thing, but I just want to meet with you, man. I like your music, this and that, whatever, whatever. And I was like, I appreciate it, you know. And and I, I was like, kind of like, why you, like, why you think mm -hmm. I, like, why am I here if you think I'm already going to Warner Brothers? At that point, I really was going to Warner Brothers. I was decided, mm -hmm. but he's like, I wanted to meet with you, kind of talk with you. And before I left the room, he was like, so good, man. Hey, man, the music's dope, man. Listen, if you want, there's you know, something over here and and just let you know, man, I don't know why you're going to Warner Brothers because Benny ain't going to be there for long. That's the wow. last thing he said as I walked out the door. Like, I was like, mm, okay, all right. And I walked out the door like, whatever. And sure enough, I signed the deal and Benny was out the door. Benny with Danny was like, wow. he, he went to focus on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air like Fresh right Prince, after yeah. that. And I was like, well, if he leaving, I'm leaving. But I, but I never thought of like, <laughs> I didn't even think I just didn't even put two and two together, you know, and um, yeah, that's something that a lot of artists I even talk to like now just about how like, you know, it's signed into a label. That's just one of kind of the pitfalls you can have where it's like you can have your guy or your girl, or your person that's really riding for you that you might sign to or whatever that'll get you signed. But if they leave you kind of lose your advocate, like you ain't got nobody fighting for you and you just yeah. are back at square one. What I'll tell you is uh, almost almost immediately I got signed to Island Records. And the interesting thing was when I went, when I signed with Warner Brothers, I signed in, in LA and it was like, stop the day, everybody, this is Eric Robinson Day, hey, right? And then when I went to, <laughs> when I showed up to Island, I think I took the train in New York. And when I got there, it was like, just a lawyer and the a &R. My, my boy, uh, Leotis Clyburn, shout out to Leotis. It was just the two of them. It was like a lawyer and Leotis, I was like, <laughs> where's the cake and like where's the you know where's the fire? It's straight where's, business where's the they were like oh, it's just it's just it's a, it's, a, it's you know it's a quiet day i was like oh okay all right sign it whatever took a picture whatever and then i i think i got back on the train i might stay the day in new york and, and then like the next day i got home but when i got back i remember my manager calling me and going yo Hiram hicks just got signed as president of mm. island and i knew immediately what that meant it was like so why the hell do we just sign there? Because he's gonna come and wipe every wipe everybody out. And and sure enough, he did. He came in and was like, Leotis lost his job. Then it was like contracts. Just it, it just wiped the whole thing out. And it's crazy because you know initially you heard your ego. You know because at first it was like, yo, listen to the music first. He's like, I don't even care. No, I got my home. I got my whole team. I'm bringing. I'm he bringing Drew Hill and, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm bringing my whole thing in. And and then later on, I ended up working with Hiram. It was it was fine because I when I worked with him, I was at this point years later. I'm like, let's get this money. Like I'm not even tripping. Like you, <laughs> you, you drop me without you know. I ain't even worried about that. Let's get this money. But um, but you understand that like that's how it was. The president come in, they like I don't care what was here before. I'm bringing my guys that I believe day. in. I'm bringing my people in and this and that mm -hmm. and that. And I had to learn that was the biggest lesson for me that like my music can't save me. Like you got to be on point. Bruh. You gotta be on point because like you can't sing your way out of this. This cat didn't care what the music sounded like. He was like, let's get out, like you out of here. So that's when I really started learning. And another thing was really important too. So Benny, Benny Medina's office had a this wall of like CDs and tapes and dats from ceiling to floor, the entire wall. Like it's crazy. Of submissions. Of just music, period. I oh, mean, just music, not, period. Okay, nah, gotcha. and, I, and I've been in this office probably like 10 times, right? Just over the last two months or whatever it was. And there's like a whole row of prints. Here's all the other names I don't know. I mean, just music, music, music. And then when I got signed, I think they said, well, what do you want to do next? Like you ever had enough time to get some food or whatever? I said, I want you to change my flight and give me some headphones. I want to listen to this wall. It was the first time I felt like I had the right to say that. And I stayed there that night, just going through, like just pulling every CD, every tape, every dad out and just listen to that whole wall. And it was the most amazing musical night of my life, hearing Prince songs I never heard for. And then like, well, who's this cat? Oh, that's the new deal we signed. His album supposed to come out, whatever, whatever. And then you never hear that. And there's mm -hmm. people on here who could clearly be the next Prince, but it never saw the light of day. It was just like, this wall was crazy. Wow. But it never left me to like, well, what happened to all those people? Like what happened to all that music? Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I think one of the reasons why I kind of went like the whole independent route was like, I never wanted to be one of the people on that wall. Like it just, that, that scared the hell out of me. Like, yo, this, this is life changing music up here. That's never going to be released. It's never going to see yeah. the light of day. And the and only reason I'm hearing it is because I'm actually signed to these, to the label. Signed to it, not asked for <laughs> you know I mean? headphones. Right, right, right. That's right. the only reason I ever heard it. 
and then you know we 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 writing songs and producing songs for people we've we've done whole albums on people and the albums never come out so you wow. like you like and, you know, I, I remember like wanting to be an artist, but yet having a career as a songwriter and seeing an artist get signed, see them flying in, getting put into some glorious hotel and recording for a month. And you think, OK, it can really pop for this person. And then whether it's the president label, the A&R department, marketing team, whatever, they like, nah. And then that person is back. And it's just over doing hair or work construction. With the, it's over. It's like how wait a minute, how is it all, that never set right with me? You know, like, how is it just over? So the Island Warner Brothers thing was, was really, really tough. After that, like I said, I went back to school and I was tough because you got to think I, during the moon time, I was in school. So I was in class while that song was playing on the radio and the video was playing. And then I was like, well, I'm leaving to go focus on the album and blow up. Ah, I'll be sure I'm the next one, you know? And and then the deal started falling apart. Like as soon as I left school, it was like, boop, 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 boop. like life really hit. And and I had to like really, but so when I went back on campus, it was like, what you doing back? Like, what? wait, what is that? You know, and it was humbling. It was really, really humbling, but my pen wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for that time going back. I became a better student every, like the person you know now, is that person who showed back up at that school, like learning like, oh, I need more. I need to know more. When you when you were with Warner, that was was that an album deal or was it just a single deal for the moon? Like, so it was, was a sing it was a single deal. Uh, it was a single deal, and before we could even go into the song was thirty three on the charts, and then Benny left. So it was like wow. It, and I think we were moving towards it was moving towards like we're gonna do a whole album deal, and then I did an album deal with with Island, and then like I said that one that one wiped out as fast yeah. as you could possibly imagine. But I remember like. The song, the moon was doing great. It was doing great for me. It was growing. It was climbing, and then it was like, "Let's move." Because <laughs> no, clearly, it was no. Clearly, it was what's a great about to song. About to, yeah, clearly, what's about to happen here is bad. Like you know, and <laughs> uh, and it was just a whole little president hop for for a nice man. It seemed like a year. You know what I mean? Just trying to go from one one label to another. Man, please tell the story as, as much as as you want to tell. Please tell the story of doing your promotional tour with L. DeBarge <sighs> of Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, one of the greatest. I, you told me this story. I never get to get we was at the guy. We was at the damn Bob Evans somewhere in the middle of Jersey. I don't know where the fuck. I just remember we was at a Bob Evans like one morning. Right, after right. The show or there's, so many, there's so many levels of it. There's so many <laughs> levels of story. But what I, what I will tell you and just respectfully, I, I remember I remember one thing. I remember one thing the the rep the Warner Brothers rep said if if L ever calls you even five o'clock in the morning wants to go play pool go play pool with him mm -hmm. you know he's like go play pool if he ever needs to talk if he needs to hang out like this is one of your main reasons for being on this tour is like if he ever needs you like follow through like answer the call and I you know it, we all know that L the bar just had some some substance issues, whatever. And this was during his clean period. So I think that what he was talking about is like, yo, if you ever want to play pool, he needs to go out and play he pool. Needs or he needs whatever. So, you know, we became fast friends in that in that time. And he was just so amazing, man. Like every hotel we showed up, he went and sat at a piano. He almost do a whole concert in that lobby, like just waiting for our rooms or just, just he would sit at the piano every time. He was just so musical. We would do a show. I mean, we did a show, I think, in Connecticut, and the sound system was just horrible. And he stood on that stage and he waited, and the sound was just trash. And he waited, let everybody crash and burn. And before, right before they opened doors, he said, Hey, brother, can I just uh, come over there? He, he talked exactly the way he said, he's saying, <laughs> Can I come over there and just, uh, just look at the mixing board if that's all right? And the guy's like, Yeah, sure. And like, probably 10 minutes, he took the mic back there and he started turning knobs and he cleared all drama, like all clouds just clear. Never, the sound sounded enormously incredible that night. And and that's just how he was. He was like, he knew how to work everything. He was a constant professional. He had been through everything. We were driving one time and I told him, I said, yo man, I really like your album. The album's great. We, we were going, I think we were take, taking a limo from Connecticut to Boston, I think it was something like that, okay. driving it. And he says, man, the album's, the album's, this album's a money album. 
I, so, remember that. I would never how, forget this. Album's a money album. Because you had told him, because you had told him it was a good album. He's like, yo, this is a good album. He's like, oh, nah, it's a money yeah, album. Nah, yeah. This ain't a good album. This is a money album. He said, I'm doing my money album so I can get a chance to do a good album. And he was like, he's Dang, like, bro. Marvin Gaye did money albums till he was able to do a good album. Bob Marley did money albums till he was able to do it. He just ran down the line. And then he just said, so this right here, that's just a money album. Cause I'm getting ready to do a good album. And he just went, just wandered <laughs> off. And I just love me thinking like, I need to do my good album. <laughs> I gotta do my good album, right. <laughs> you know, it's like every, I mean, he just had, I could have made a t-shirt off of everything he said. You know what I mean? You know, uh, I remember we was at his birthday party and uh, and not- Was this, was uh, this the don't, don't fall in love, man? Don't fall in love, man. He, said, he, just, he, he, saw, he saw my eyes was glistening that night. And he said, he was like, he said, hey man, don't fall in love. Just don't fall in love. <laughs> I was like, too late, L. <laughs> yeah. the, t- the wisdom of L. Yeah, the, wi- the wisdom more. of, I make a whole album on the wisdom of L, but it was just, it was to learn like a constant professional, man. His showmanship on and off stage was just, you know, he was just tough mm-hmm. and, it, and it, you know, and also I was a person, it was probably the start of, I was a person who always had vocal issues. I mean, I got hoarse. I mean, mind you, I was doing like two songs in the show and then get out the way. And in those two songs, I was struggling to maintain my, I was getting hoarse and stuff like that. So to see somebody who sang all day, all, all day. night, on stage, off stage, it really, it really blew me away. And it was probably on the steps of like, how do I get to that point? How do I get to a point where I can get more health, like really healthier? That get that stamina, um, yeah. And 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 that was the start of it. Like, and I was I was nineteen, really. So I was it was it was crazy, but it was a good learning lesson for me. Like, yo, this is this. If you're gonna learn from a pro, <laughs> learn from that on Elder Barge. Was esoteric? Was that your first um, independently released? Well, not independently. Was that your first album? Period. Like that actually saw the light of day. Yeah, yeah. It's the first album. Period. So, uh, what's crazy is that I I had moved to Atlanta, and I eventually, eventually ran into ran into Touch of Jazz. So that was like like life changing moment was like working mm-hmm. at Touch of Jazz. And then I moved back, I went back to Atlanta to just get my stuff. Cause I, from the moment I met Touch of Jazz, like when, the moment I went to Jazzy Jeff studio, it's like, I just never left. Rock with and you, I went yeah, to, but I still one of my favorite like records. Just, I love Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, me and Jeff, me and all those brothers at a Touch of Jazz was like, that was graduate school for me. That was like the life changing moment for me. But when I went back to get my truck and like move out of my apartment, I had a session with Joe and Uncle Sam. I was working at Noontown. Wow, at Noon Noontown, Teddy Bishop. Teddy Bishop, Teddy Bishop, Teddy Bishop yeah. Jazzy Noonie. Faye, mm-hmm. uh, Brian Michael, uh, Brian, Brian Michael, Michael Cox. Cox. Uh, I mean, just killers in this, in, in, in down there, mm-hmm. and. I think Joe had a concert. So when he went, he's like, I'm going to go to my concert and I'm going to come back and finish the song. So I went to take a nap at a friend's house and left just, but mind you, I'm leaving the next day. I'm driving back up to Jersey and someone broke into my truck and took, just took the bag out the front seat. And that bag was every song I ever recorded up to that point. So it's like everything in high school, everything in college, everything at Warner brothers, everything at Island, all gone in, in just a, a snap. Like I come out to the car and it's just glass everywhere, the truck or whatever. And uh, and that was like, that was really like, oh snap. So I mean, it was like really starting over. Starting over, I about to say it's a full reset. Completely full reset. Yeah. And then I went, you know, I was still working on, of course, working on Touch of Jazz. And then I just started, um, I started just working on Esoteric. And then it was like, I didn't have a deal. You know, and it was like at that point, I'm I'm Eric Robertson, a songwriter. Like I'm proud of myself. Mm-hmm. Every room I walk in, hey, I'm Eric Robertson, a songwriter. And did you so, had you signed your deal, your songwriting deal with EMI at that time, or was this prior yeah, to that? Yeah, I had my I had my publishing deal. I had my publishing deal with um with EMI at the time, and, and things were working for me. I mean, as a songwriter, I couldn't have been happier. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. at this point, I that's you talking about the music, soul child stuff, the Vivian Green stuff. Everything's mm-hmm. working. But I just wasn't satisfied, and I had I got it. I actually had a a bad like a bad breakup, and that's what really sparked it. Like I was like, let me just start, just close the studio door and just start working. That was the only way I knew how to get back to neutral. Was like just write. So I was either writing in a journal or I was writing a song. It was like back and forth, 
and then the album was done and it was I, I it really was like i was just unwilling to sell these songs because they were like they were way too personal way too much and it was like oh, i'm just gonna i think i'm just gonna put it out and i remember like really the homies like all laughing like what, what you mean you're gonna put it out you're just gonna put it out i was like i think i'm just gonna put it out like how <laughs> you, got no, you, you got a record there now like no nah, i'm just gonna figure it out and put it out and that was it it's just it started and this is 2000 what two or what 2000, is this? 2000, 2001. One, okay. And, and and mind you, by no means without a first, by no means. I remember Dwelly had Rise. Mm. I knew of I knew of a lot of artists who were independent and in different states and everywhere. Um, shout out to Fertile Ground, who was the first. Yes, Atlanta. Was like, yeah, Navasha. Yeah. You know, putting out music, like independently putting out music and selling records. So by no means without a first. If anything that was different from me and anyone else, I remember like, I remember Carl Thomas being an independent artist. Um, I remember uh, Kim. I remember Kim before before mm-hmm. Motown signed him. Uh, John Legend before uh, before it was, was John Stevens. Yeah, was John he, Stevens. We had, had the Kobe. He had, he had the Kobe haircut. Yeah, was, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So I remember it. The difference was like, you know, once you sold a certain amount of records independently, the labels would come scoop you up. That's how it, that was a normal thing. And I was like, well, what happens if, if you don't sign with them? What happens if you certain, sell a certain amount and then just keep going? Keep rocking, yeah. What what, what will happen then? And I think that if anything is different, that's that's the part where we got to the we got to the point where we could have went to a deal and 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 worked their stuff out. We had sold enough records, we had got enough attention. And then guess what? Most of the labels, because of my songwriting stuff, knew who I was. And for whatever reasons, if there was situations we, which, which we did have some, they didn't work out. But for the most part, I was like, let's just push through, man. Let's push through and see what happens. And it worked out, man. I mean, to be honest with you, it, it, I, you sit here and think I had a master plan. I didn't. It just worked out. <laughs> it really. Yeah. Worked. And when you formed with your label, Blue Arrow Soul, was that like, how did you assemble, I guess, the team? You know, was it, you know, you go to your parents and say, hey, I need some help? Uh, is it just homies you work with? Like, how did you work those steps of figuring out what you needed as an independent artist? The first part was the, the fans challenged me to take it more serious. They wanted more music and it was like, okay, mm-hmm. if we're going to, cause I thought I was going to put an album out and then just go back to songwriting and producing for people. But they were like, we want more, we want more. It was like, okay, how do we work that out? The biggest difference, the first step was my dad retired. And okay. then I remember he came into the studio one time and at that point I would do like, I would record all night and then I might would go to the gym for like a couple of hours. And then I would, from like 12 to four, was just like packing CDs up and like just making printing packages. And I would spend that time at the post office. And then when I finished the post office, say five o'clock, it was back recording from five to four o'clock till I just couldn't stand up anymore. And, and I repeated it. And my dad walked in one day when I was like preparing stuff. He says, what you doing here? I was like, I gotta ship all this stuff off, like ship ship the CDs off. And he's like, you need help? <laughs> That's how I was thought. He's like, you need help with that? And I was like, if you could take this to the post office, that, that would be a lot of help. And he was like, yeah, cool. So then I was at that point, I was like, okay, I can just focus on music. And to be honest with you, you know, Jarrell, who has been one of my best friends, he has managed me off Shout and on Jarrell, throughout my yeah. career. Yeah, you know, he's he's been around. And I think Jarrell kind of watched for a while and he was like eventually stepped in was like how you need help let's whatever and um and then the rest of truth be told the rest of it was like fans i think wow. sweet locks was around and she was around it was like what do you do i like hey join me let's you know it's like mm-hmm. sweet locks eventually joined on um demo eventually joined on and she yeah, eventually yeah. joined on it was really i mean and mind you I don't want to naively think that they were just like fans. Yeah, it was more like these are people who also had desires in the industry, mm-hmm. but they were around. And the more we talked, it was like, well, I'm trying to do this. What do you do? You know, yeah. there's, uh, there's a mutual win here. There, there's we, a mutual yeah, win. Can... There's a mutual win. Like even uh, Demo, uh, I think he was he sung background for me on a show. Like somebody linked me up and he sung background. You know, at that point it was like house band show up, whatever, whatever. And mm-hmm. then we started picking up a band. I think he came and said, if I show up to a show up to a show, can I do the gig? And I was like, yeah, sure. Okay. I was like, next show is in Toronto, Canada. He's like, all right, cool. He was in Toronto. I was like, next show is in LA. He was in LA. And then the oh, next wow. show was in Atlanta. He was in Atlanta. So now I was like, how are you getting here? Like, he's like, well, I'm <laughs> figure this out. So then I remember like, 
so can you get my band tickets like that? And he's like, yeah, y'all can do that. And that's how he started book. That's how he started. He started like he, he's been like the road manager, the background singer, road manager ever since. Yeah. Then, you know, and and I remember like Anshia, who now is a powerhouse in the booking. She's booking everybody's shows. But I remember we were this probably six, seven years ago. She was already in the staff. She was rocking in the staff. But I said, I need more help in the booking area. Can someone move over? And she was like, I'll move the booking. And mind mm-hmm. you, she probably already has some insight on it. But then she she moved over there and like just started rocking. So it was really just a community of people that were trying to grow, trying to be better. And I was fortunate they joined up with me to to join in with my company. And it's great because now they have their own businesses and their families and, and their own successes, but yet can invest in, in mine as well. So it's it's been great. The history, I mean, the history of just who's worked for me, who's played for me, I, is probably one of my proudest, proudest things. Like just- Man, man, you know, yeah. Killers, yeah, yeah, killers. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm honored, I'm honored to see- Yeah, Demo, man, Demo, I, I got a shout out. I mean, just first off, I mean, yeah. your whole team. I mean, every time we've always traveled, you know, it's always been love. It's always just been, you know, you, you, you just have amazing people around you. And that was just a, a big lesson. I think I learned just from kind of touring with you and just kind of seeing the way you built out your infrastructure of just, okay, like these is just like people that he really fuck with and they just fuck with him. You know what I mean? And they trust each other. And, um, you know, Demo, I got to shout Demo out. Demo saved my life one night. I was, it was after (laughs) we did, bro, it was after we did Chicago. We did Chicago and, um, I feel like this is around the same time that like my dad was dying, like all this shit is going on. Wow. But um, so it's after the show and uh, and it's late and I'm just in the lobby. I don't even I can't remember what it was. I was even I was outside talking to something, but I was just in the lobby. Demo shows up with a bucket. A goddamn hurls. Let me tell you something, bro. <laughs> <laughs> he showed with a bu- Demo show. He just in the lobby with a bucket of hurls. And I think he had his kids with him that night. And, uh, yeah, and I was like, I said, yo, I said, yo, I said, yo, man, I said, you know, I ain't even try. I said, bro, man, let me get one of them wings. He said, oh, no, nah, bro, I got you, man. Come on, I got you. Man, he gave me some of them wings, bro. Listen, I said, you are the realest dude. Like, to part with Harold's in Chicago, <laughs> that is the sacrifice. Like, so big up. It saved your life. Man, nah. listen, I, need, I needed that wing right then. I really needed it. <laughs> yeah, it, but that's a you know what good guy like said man you know and it's funny you know as now i'm a parent but i watched this guy as being a solid dad to his kids you know what i mean and you know and, and i think he's a perfect example of everybody has had to wear multiple hats on my team and i i love watching like a, a venue manager or promoter watch finish up negotiations with him and then, and then watch him go on stage the jacket and get on stage and then like sing and they're like yo wait a minute what's the same dude it's like but guess what we all had to we all had to do it. we all had to wear different hats to to make all this work you know what i mean so so shout out to him yo find demos music you know you got a new album coming out in the whole nine once yes, again indeed. like everybody everybody that's in the team is working on something and um and i'm honored like i said i'm honored that they take time to build with me and that they're building their own stuff as well what was the record for you that I, you know as an independent artist you know because you have you have your moments so you have some records that like will go all the way off and then you have some to just be like all right this did cool um what was the record for you that like kind of was the one where you was like, okay, I think I got it. Cause I can tell you what it was for me as a fan, but I don't know what it was like for you on the business side. Um, for me, it was left. And I ain't even saying that just cause I was on it, but like yeah. left, I mean, I, I got uh vault 1.5. That was the first record I ever bought of yours. And gotcha. I actually got that one before I got esoteric. I was in, um I was in Chicago. We was on a little brother. Um, We was on a little brother tour stop and we went to it was that virgin mega store that used to be uh in chicago like yep. that, that big virgin mega store and um i just saw you i just saw your joint eric robeson and i knew you from the jazzy jeff album mm. and so i was like i was like oh he got it i was like oh i i caught this and i bought that and i played you know the first record you know is you know it couldn't hear me over the music and i was just like oh my 
God. <laughs> and like I ran that whole record. That record got me through that tour. You know what I'm saying? And so that was the first one. And then when I saw that one and I saw it was produced by Redhead Kingpin, I was like, oh, what? Like, how did that <laughs> come, Monster. come about? Monster. First of all, Redhead, one of the most talented producers visionaries i've ever even been in a room with right and i'm honored that i that, that we that he even allowed me to do that song with him uh I, but i would tell you couldn't hear me all the music was probably the song that probably like changed everything and then from there it was able to grow right so gotcha. you know here everyone's like eric that's eric robertson the songwriter and truth be told even before that like when i was doing songs off of esoteric and off of like when I was doing the vault album, a lot mm -hmm. of the times playing when I played the songs or when people heard the songs, they were like, can we buy them? So, wow. so that was, so the left, gotcha. the, the vault was, was a heavy draw the line in the sand. I'm not selling these songs. Like it was like, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and truth be told, no. So it's vault volume 1.5. Why is it that? Because volume one had hold on, which eventually went to Dwele. Went to Dwele. Yeah. Um, Yo, yeah. I wanted to ask you too. Yeah. Like, so that, cause I love that fucking song. Dwayne Bassiani, the producer. Dwayne Bassiani, yeah. What's the what's the deal with him? Like, how did you guys know each other? With the college together, man. We met. Okay. Uh, I was walking into the Drew Hall at Howard University, freshman year, with a keyboard under my arm. He was like, "Yo, you do music?" And I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> like, I do too." And he he came to my room, and I think he was my roommate freshman year. <laughs> like it was just like <laughs> I had this little small room by the size of this chair I'm sitting in, and it's like everybody saw me walk into that that dorm room with a keyboard and like some little minuscule equipment and it was like mm -hmm. oh it's on and popping in this room like it, I, my room was never empty people would just work on music and, and guess what it's an honor that there's still a lot of Dwayne Bastiani's on my new album that we just yeah. put out and yes indeed you know, but Jermaine Mobley and you know so many so many brother Tracy Lee so many cats I met Mm -hmm. when I got there and just started bonding with that, we still do do music, you know, to this day. Um, but yeah, the, 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 that was, that was just right, right with homies. But the first album eventually had to be changed because yeah, I was heavy into songwriting. Carl Thomas, I wrote Rebound was on. Rebound one, it was on the second. That was yeah. Carl, so it was like, okay, let's change this up. <laughs> 1.5. And then from this point on, like it's this all is, mine. Right? This is this is it now. I'm not selling anything. You're not gonna hear no problems, no whatever, whatever. Um, I think volume one had one time with with Jill Scott on it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So it was like so the boom. But then was previous was previous cats was that on the vault? No, one, no, or was that okay? No, nah, previous cats was I never I had never released it. Previous cats I had just played for. I had wrote it in college with Jermaine Mobley, but I had played it for music, just a demo of it and. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, before he ever had a record deal, and he was like, oh, "I want that for my second album." I was wow. like, "Like what? You, know, you ain't even signed on your first album yet." Like <laughs> then he gets signed, and it was like, "Yo, remember that previous cat?" No, no, that's my second album. All right, cool, man. Shoot your shot. He puts the album out. Of course, he comes music soul it child. Goes off. Uh -huh. And then, and then, sure enough, he called me like, "Hey, yo, I'm starting my second album. Yo, you still got that previous cat song?" I was like, yo, you different, man. <laughs> you, <laughs> you different. I was like, yeah, and we recorded. But I, I don't know why I never put that song, because me and Jermaine Mobley worked on a lot of records. He's on that, mm -hmm. he's on that Vault album. But for some reason, uh, I think, you know what, real talk, by the time I'm starting to release the records, and I think that's just the songwriter in me. Like once music said, I like that song, even if I wanted it on my second album, I was like, this is for music now. I like probably, uh -huh. I probably never even considered it for myself, which is probably why it was not on the vault record. Nah, I'm, nah it's, it's funny you say that. I'm, I'm the exact same way. Like for me, yeah. if someone is speaking for it, like our mentality in our camp is that there's always another song. So yeah. if someone, if we write something and they like, yo, I want it. It's like, all right, cool, it's yours. And we'll just yeah. sit it it's whenever you're ready for it. Cause we can always make something else. So the Vault 1.5, that was, you know, you say that was the one that kind of, you know, that was kind of lying in the sand. And then left for me, that was the moment when I saw, because, you know, I was, I mean, I was just a fan. So when you hit me that yeah. night, uh, when you came to Jersey, we went to your crib, I was just like, all right, I'm just kicking it with one of the homies. Like, I, I, I was not aware. I mean, I knew your catalog. I knew, like, your writing and stuff. But 
you know, I'm just like, man, I'm just kicking it. This this big bro, I'm just kicking it. Yeah. But when Left came out and when I saw the response that like Ben and Love got and I saw it was people hit me like, yo, you I heard you on Arrow, Eric Robeson new album. And I was like, oh, like this dude, like, oh, wow. Like he got people like really out here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. That was that was just that was from my experience. That was, you know, from my vantage point when that record came out, I just saw you know, just the people that were hitting me. I mean, it was, it, it, it really put a lot of eyes on me that I, I did not expect at all. Well, probably vice versa. I think, you know, our relationship just in general, every time we did a song, I think it, 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 oh, it definitely boosted me. And if it, if it boosted you, that'd be great. Nah, it, as did. Well. it did. You know, I think left, everything was a growing lesson. You know, right after that, we did music fan first and we get, that's when we started getting nominated for Grammys and stuff like that. Bro, so it's like, we, and we, and we, and we have to note because all our listeners, uh, yeah. Arrow and I have the honor of losing the same Grammy right. to Indie Right. <laughs> right. Thank you, India. Thank you for, thank thank you. for submitting your song and uh, beating out me. both my asses there. to the crib. Yes. Right, right. And uh, so, so, you know, it was just different. Everything was just different levels. It was like, it was constantly growing. It was just like, you know, for me, and, and, and I'll be honest with you, I mean, I, I probably kept my head down and just worked so much. I probably didn't spend much time, like, acknowledging the groundwork that was being laid and like how much things were moving, you know, mm -hmm. I just remember being a struggling artist and then one day not struggling one day, like, you know, oh, man, listen, we talk, I remember, <laughs> I remember us having that conversation during Tigalero where it's just like, listen, yeah. man, I'm finally at a point in my life where I'm making the music I want to make and I'm not fucking broke. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, I mean, that's it, you know, it, it. whatever you get on top of that is gravy, you know what I mean? But I, I remember, I certainly remember those conversations when, um, when you did, uh, it was, it was music fan first, the box album. I want to specifically ask you about that one. You did a record, which is like in still like one of my top five arrow records. It might be top three. I don't know, but wow. your record with the just imagine with King. Whew. Oh my God. I was so yes. mad when I heard that record. Yes. I was like, Oh my God. Please talk about uh, Paris and Amber. Um, man, I just love them to death. And, uh, you know, we've First all song. been long time yeah, supporters man. of them. Yeah. But we you know I want to make sure I say it on this platform, too, because it's very important. It's something I've been talking about, um, especially with my, with my students. So, you know, I teach at Berkeley College of Music mm -hmm. in Boston. And, and one of the things that I learned when I got there was like how how many female musicians or female artists have been talked out of their greatness Man. out of ignorance of men out of ignorance of just surroundings of just like the fact that like um that we should be shocked that a female could make a dope beat right like how insulting <laughs> right yo, you <laughs> right. made that beat like yo you a female you made a beat like that is almost kind of like you know it's the ignorant statements it's, that we can it's like he like, speaks so well or some shit. It's right. like you speak so well as a black person like <laughs> what, what do you mean by right. that you know so 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 like I, i'm i'm really dedicated to try to change that character that the situation but let's say even before i learned of the ignorance i was always one if you dope you dope right Period. and yeah. male female Period. so you look yeah. at look at the history of my work whether who's been on stage with me who i've done songs with whatever whatever if you dope you dope whether you a female, male, whatever, right? I was in LA, just it, my my wife had got tickets with her girlfriend to go see Oprah's last, you know, her, her last show or whatever, mm -hmm. she was in LA, and they got tickets to LA. So we had just had my first son, I'm in LA, we had a, some Mexican restaurant. I'm really there just babysitting. I got my kid and my my wife and this young lady walks up and goes, um, can I take a picture? You know, I, I, I'm a big fan of your music. I'm like, no problem. Yeah, sure. So we take a picture. And then while we're taking the picture, she says, you know, I just did an album with one my sister and a good friend of mine, and I produced it and mixed it. And, and I was like, I was like, oh, word. Okay, cool. I said, can I buy it? Can I buy it from you right now? She's like, no, I'll give it to you. No, no, no. I'm going to buy it from you. And she gave me something. I gave her a $20 bill and she gave me it. And then I noticed it was only three songs. And I said, damn, I just paid $20 for three songs, right? <laughs> but I was like, it's all good. It's all love, <laughs> right? Dude, that's some track source prices, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I was like, cool. So, but but just in just basic, I was like, I was like, all right, what's your name? This and she said, her name's Paris. And I was like, all right, cool. And the group's name King. I was like, all right, cool. This is great. And yo, listen, my information, this, that, this, that. Just, just sewing into it. Like, yo, this seems dope. Pre-deck, like the other album cover, whatever. We get in the car. 
And the first song has this like drum beat intro. And I remember this went, whatever it did, and I paused it. <laughs> exactly. When that part even came in, I stopped it. My wife would tell you, I looked at it, I said, this is about to be incredible. Just off the <laughs> drum intro. I stopped it. I was like, get ready. Cause I just realized that this is something <laughs> different here. This is, I said, this is about to be incredible. So we pressed play. And I mean, I could not stop listening to this music for like, I, it was just a soundtrack for whatever. So I call her back mm. like, oh my God, who are, this is incredible. And then I remember Prince calls and Erica Badu calls. And like, they, it, mm -hmm. I remember like just hearing her going, mm -hmm. oh my God, these, we're getting these calls. And then boom, now we all know King as, as King. And it's an honor to, I called her and was like, yo, I want you to produce a song for on my album. Like I want you to produce, not not because you have dope female, not whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. because you dope. Period. Period. And, Listen. And, um, and I want y'all on it. Like I want, I want y'all on it. And I think the world knows King clearly now. But I was, I was honored to be like, yo, everybody, this is King. Like you know, mm -hmm. like you know, I want y'all to to shine some light on this, and I want to write a check to this young lady. Yeah, let's who, talk about who is, who's wearing this hat as a producer on my record. Like, you know, I was like, let's, let's, let's really do it. And, um, and it came out as a, a killer song, just imagine, as well as I like, keep it really 100. It's one of the rare songs on one of my albums. That I did not write. Mm. If not the very first one, like, like she wrote it, she produced it. It was like, no, like, like, and I, it's like, it wasn't a statement. It's just, you know, it's dope. It's like, listen, I don't need to write. It's, it's fire. The track's fire. I was like, this is, <laughs> right. I, I want this, you know what I mean? So, uh, and and they just, I mean, she's still like still one of my favorite producers. Oh um, man, uh, yeah, I, I man, I love Incredible. them to death. Like I was yeah. so happy to see them like you know playing with with Coldplay. It was just like, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? Like I mean, so yeah. so happy for them, man. Big ups to King. Um, yeah. So there was another because I'm thinking of just like all the people that like you kind of collab with and everything. Um. I wanted to talk to you about go back to Picture Perfect because yeah. I will never forget at that time it was you know kind of going back to the you know with the label things happening that record was about to be out of here and then what happened uh so we 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 got distributed through E1 and that's when Shadow was there uh, so Shadow was like the main radio and the main reason I think, you know, we going from music fan first to like, all right, what, how do we follow up? Like these, these Grammy nominations that we lose in the India. Uh, the second one, I lost to CeeLo, shout out to CeeLo. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was like, well, why don't we do this situation? And at that point, you know, you did the record with Anthony David and Algebra, that joint went mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah, one. we did the Forevermore record. Yeah. Forevermore. And it was like, it seemed like a good spot. And then. It, my, it's just once again my whole thing is like just stay on your path man like just stay on your path keep doing and then so here we go doing this thing because it seems like with this shadow and radio and stuff like that shadow leaves and it just like there was no momentum there was no momentum but mind you even with that picture perfect was a huge record for me it was a it was a it was a really impactful moment to me but it was also a moment where i was like it really anchored us into like what like we we really don't need these other companies like we probably would have made bro picture perfect would have probably arguably been bigger if we just did everything ourselves like completely a hundred percent ourselves like you know we got we, we coming off this thing and so it was the only time where i technically had muscle if you want to mm -hmm. call that muscle and it was like it, we actually did less than what I think wow. my my actual team would have done if we if we controlled the whole thing, you know what I'm saying? But it was like I said, it was it was still a I can't get off stage without singing the song. Oh <laughs> yeah, know? oh yeah, nah, you ain't making it out of the building. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah it's, but it's not but happening. yet, <laughs> but yet when you look at like the the album before that, which we which we put everything together for it, you know, we can't get off stage without singing dealing. We can't get off stage singing, mm -hmm. you know, certain things. So it was one of those things where it was like, yo you doing all right like stay on your stay on your path <laughs> you know and uh you said something not too long ago on on uh i think you just don't you was talking on ig and i think you were like it never goes wrong like when 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 it's like when it's just me doing it or when i like when we oh have yeah betting on it. yourself yeah when on, it was like it was just like it was just anchoring in it was like man you know 
I, I'm fine. Like, mind you, I always tell everybody completion is the most important word in the music business. It's like, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it. Uh, it's the difference between who wins and who loses. Yo, my company at now, we are celebrating 21 years now, right? Talk that shit, bro. Yes. Yes. And we're, we're not celebrating it because we, we successfully did everything right. We completed everything we tried. Yeah. And the thing, and let's be clear about something 21 years. So I want to make this, you know, this, this specification. 21 years as independent R&B artists. Like, people <laughs> have no idea, you know, like, when when Dame Dash, when he was, like, years, you know, decades ago, when he was, like, you know, selling rap is like selling crack, but, like, selling R&B is like selling coke. It just requires a different, <laughs> you know, when, when he was talking about, you know, the Chris John album and why it didn't really go yeah. on Rockefeller. And, you know, and I listen, I've never sold drugs a day in my life, but I understood what he was saying when I got into the business, because totally. I can be, you know, a hip hop. Like I'm sitting right here in my hoodie and, and like sweatpants. I can take a selfie right now and be like, this is the cover of my new album. And as long as I'm spitting on it, like no one will care. But R&B, you do not have that liberty. Like the look got to be right. Like R&B is a money game, bro. And to do it for 21 years, I mean, that really is a, is a testament. And I, I, I want you to speak to just the, the challenges of that, just so some of our listeners and some, because you know, we have a lot of a lot of artists that listen to the show and kind of tap in just for, you know, for different game. Right. So just talk to them about your, you know, how you're able to make it work without having that, you know, 100,000 or whatever to spend on a video or just to be frivolous. You know, how do you well, make that work? I think the difference really comes down to is... The first thing that separates it in, in R and B was quality. So the the first mm -hmm. the first obstacle we had to show was like, yo, this is of the same quality, right? So immediately think Facts. hip hop independently or or major is the same. They, it wasn't looked at. Yo, if you can spit, if the beast fire, it's cool. We accept it. With R and B and soul music, if it wasn't a major, it, you for some reason looked at it like this is this is less. This is not, oh, not yeah. as much effort was put in. You like, no, no, you could tell. Yeah, you could tell. Like, you could always see that artists were like, OK, they have a major album and it's like, OK, this is the major album. But then they get off the major and they put out something they sell and like the cover look like fucking clip art. You know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, right. It just, it's just the presentation is just all the way. It's, it's not up to par. You know, I mean? think I think one thing that I've been very fortunate also, and, I, and I've got to say that is that you know, we got Dre and Vidal on records when they're working on Usher and Music and Jill and they're working on my record. We got Rich Harrison, when he's working on Beyonce, but yeah, he's working on my record. You know what I mean? As well as mixed with my brother B Jazz and, and you know, just Aaron Harden from my band, just different people. Yes, just, once again, yeah, if, yeah. if you're dope, you're dope. I, whether you're a super producer, Grammy Award, whatever, or you just a homie I met in a house band in Florida, if you're dope, you're dope. I, I have no problem with working with whoever, right? And but yet at the same time, it has to has to move like that. That whole thing chasing goosebumps means everything. Like mm -hmm. for me, that's the only rule in the studio. Does it give you goosebumps? But that same thing with the album cover. The album cover got to make you go, oh my God, that's crazy. I wish I thought of that. Or, you know, that's crazy. You know, so the first man, thing- speaking of album covers, I just, before, I yeah. cannot forget, um, man, we lost uh, a, a mutual friend uh, in the past year in uh, oh, Fave, Fave, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, Fave is uh, the brother. He did the Mr. Nice Guy album cover. He, um, podcaster, singer, producer, Fave had a hot sauce, like yeah. <laughs> Fave. I mean, y'all gotta think I'm a Renaissance he man. Fave was a Renaissance man. He had no, a bow tie company. He the did. bow tie yep. company. No, dude was like, it's crazy because, you know, and it was tough. That was tough losing Fave, and we miss him truly. But he's been a graphic designer for me, um, and it's crazy because like he did the uh, Mr. Nice Guy album cover. Uh, he designed multiple T-shirts. I put out a Christmas card every year. Like a growing mm -hmm. Christmas card, an animated Christmas card. He would card. do like he, that. He, yeah. He do, the right. Pug named Fender Jones. Based, yeah. off his, based off his, yeah. And then, um, but then he also produced a music for me. He's uh, shot photography for, I mean, he's, he's worn so many hats. He's been a part of, of my team and just well as the, the entire movement. He's worn so many hats of like, 
like I said, whether it was the sauce <laughs> he was cooking with <laughs> or the bow tie company, you know, and and even that, it was like when he made the bow ties, like that was Demo's lane. Demo was the bow tie guy, so uh-huh. out of respect, was like, "Yo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass that off to Demo. You, you rock with that." But the bow ties was killing. Like, so he's worn mm-hmm. so many, so many hats, and you know, this is this was tough. Like, you know, uh, I, I lost a lot of good friends in in during the pandemic that were very intricate to like what what we do. And Fave was one of the people, man. We're like. You know, this Christmas was this last Christmas was tough because guess what? He yeah. would have been making this Christmas card. He'd been doing the and card, then, yeah. And then as we're going into the album and figuring out how we're going to make the new T-shirts or the graphic, he's the first call. You know, and 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 a, and a big up. You know, I will say this. I make sure I say it because Jarrell was our point person between that. Like Jarrell was always the one who was sitting with Fades and make sure mm-hmm. he, would, my wife, would be happy with how she was drawn or whatever this and that. <laughs> you know? right, right, right. And right. um. And and he really, you know, he really he really lost a partner in that way. But Fave was a, a solid dude, man, and and we try uh, to honor him. Beautiful brother, man. Beautiful yeah, guy. Yeah, like that was my him. man. But he was one. But he was one of the people who, you know, you up you up two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, making slight changes so that when people see it, they see the effort, they see the quality. Mm-hmm. And I think it, at the end of the day, it just comes down to that. Like, I want you to put my album next to whoever's album, D'Angelo, Usher whoever faith whatever I, I want you to put it as the best album that year and whether it's better or not i'm not here to say it's better i'm here to say it's going to be of the same quality guess what we recorded it's going to be seamless yeah with mm-hmm. the same mics we shot it with the same type of photographers we we're we're, we're investing in in our uh and it doesn't have to be that it's a five hundred thousand dollar budget you know guess what we all, all are operating on million dollar budgets whether, whether we got a million dollars or not we all putting our <laughs> best foot forward Tigalero, we putting our best foot forward you know we, yeah. we writing we challenge each other and and, and i mean that was so even Tigalero, even that was like the way the cover art and everything it was just I mean, that was because at the time you were, yeah. I think you were on tour or, you know, where you had, you know, your kids and then I was on tour. So we never had a real photo shoot for that album. We never had a photo shoot. No, nope, but let's find a dope picture. Let's figure out a dope way to put it together mm-hmm. that could that could tell a story. And to this day, I mean, it's it's, it's one of the, it's so, it's like a minimalist, simplistic out, but it's so <laughs> symbolic. And, I, and you ran point more on that one, real talk, but we are from the same place. Like these uh, these album covers tell a story, and there's a reason yeah. why this picture is this way or whatever. And yeah, and that was the thing because I saw the joke. We had the picture, and I was like, "All right, well, my whole thought was, I'm like, okay, we got these pictures of us live, and they did a mock up of us like singing. You know, it, it was some pictures from our Chicago show at the Shrine. Chicago rest show, in yeah. peace. Um, <laughs> you yeah. know, what I mean, we did the shows at the Shrine, and uh, we. Uh, the brother it t- it took him. I cannot remember his name. Please forgive me. But you know, I, I got some from him, and he had them. And I was like, "All right, this is dope." And we did a couple mock-ups with my man, uh, my man Chris Charles. And so, but when I showed it uh, to everyone's independent soul A and R butter at Soul Bounce, <laughs> right? <Come> on, butter. <laughs> you know, shout out, shout out to the buttress and, and Red Velvet, uh, Susan. But um, I sent her a mock-up of it, and she was like, yo, this is dope, but it looks like a live album. And I was like, oh, nah, mm. like that. So that's when I got the idea. I was like, okay, if I drop it down where it's just our faces, like, covering mm-hmm. over, it'll look like the King of Rock cover, you know what I'm saying, the Run exactly. DMC. And then if we put the, the titles on the front with the barcode, that's a call back to Urban Hang Suite. That's what so it's like exactly. the double it's like that's that to me was what Tigalero represent i'm like we are two hip-hop dudes like without a doubt but you know also with soul and it's that brilliant. shit worked <laughs> but, but and, think of it think of like, like i said we're taking run dmc and maxwell and put it together that is Tigalero. you know what i'm saying yeah. so it's like it was all it was all planned and all well thought out but that's the talking about like it ain't just no, we ain't just throwing this together. It's putting some effort, time, and like a science behind it. And it and it and it makes it makes sense. And every album cover I've seen you do, every song I've seen you do, it's the same effort. And I feel like the same thing we do. Same for you, man. Nah, you level of you be kicking my ass. I'll be like, damn, Arrow got another album out. Shit, I gotta do oh, something. Whatever. <laughs> I'm like, man, you got you did you came to hear from here. I was like, damn, he 
We ain't been in the house for two months. This nigga got an album already. I'm like, damn. Yeah, <laughs> like, look, I, that's because I that's because I was scared. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> wait, wait, show's getting canceled. I'm not going back to teaching. I'm like, what is happening? I was like, give me that pen real quick. Let me. <laughs> you know, for me, whenever I whenever I feel, I'm, I mean, and I mean that like music for me is like my aspirin or whatever. Like when I when fave pass when paris bowens pass when chadwick mm. chadwick boseman chadwick, passed, yes man. when any of that stuff the first thing i did was i turned the equipment on you know not like oh it's just that's when when the pandemic started i turned the equipment on it's like for me my whole view on creativity my whole view on art my whole view on all of it is different and i'm a i have an album called music fan first and it means i'm the fan of it first first mm-hmm. thing it's it's the soundtrack to my life it's what brings me peace it what brings me ease so on my worst day i'm picking the picking a pin up on the worst day i'm picking a guitar on the worst day on my best day i'm doing it as well so mm-hmm. so yeah it's not like i'm like i'm racing i'm making the first pandemic album it's like <laughs> 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 I'm gonna beat everybody to the punch. It was just more like, so my what did you do? <laughs> you know, who's sick? Oh my God. Uh, let me just write. And I just started recording. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just, I didn't know any, any, but it's crazy. I've done two albums during the pandemic, but, but it, it, I just couldn't stop writing. You know what I mean? I wanted to talk to you, uh, when you speak on as well, man, um, you, you know, I met through you, um, you know, kind of, you know, through you, Anakin and Vader, man. Um, these brothers are just amazing. Shout out uh, to them. Like those yes, my guys. Life changing, amazing brothers, man. Man, um, and you brought them on to executive produce uh, your new album, uh, Lessons, which is, you know, again, just great record, man. Like, just I Thank can't, you. you know, top to top to bottom, just always consistent. Um, how did you link up with them and what was the decision to make Lessons kind of the first? single so meeting them goes back a while and this is a lesson for people just to shoot your shot right so you know now i got three kids and usually when i do a show now i'm catching the first thing smoking to get back home right so a lot of times you'll find me at the airport five o'clock in the morning Mm -hmm. you know right after the show dog tired walking through like a zombie and I was at an airport and I was just trying to stay awake. I remember I was just like trying not to fall asleep. So I was like just scrolling through Instagram, whatever I could do to keep myself occupied. And I saw somebody had tagged me on something. And it the name was Anakin Invader. And I was like, <laughs> Anakin, did y'all name yourselves at the Star Wars villains? That's the first thing that caught my attention. Mm-hmm. Like, 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 as in Darth Vader, as in Anakin? Anakin before? Skywalker, yeah. I was like, <laughs> that's interesting. So click. I clicked it because it caught my attention and it was uh sure enough it was like skywalker fighting darth vader with like a hip-hop beat under it (laughs) and i was like oh that's dope okay next one and then it was like princess leia like kissing han solo with like (laughs) and i was like y'all kind of got that off i said that's what y'all doing and then probably like 10 like I was, I'm went through their page. I probably spent like 10 minutes on their page. And then I hit them back. I said, yo, you got my attention. What's up? And then like before the plane could take off, I remember like within 10 minutes, like it was like as if they could see that I was looking at their page or whatever. I don't know. But as soon as I said, you got my attention. What's up? A Dropbox link. It cling. It came right Bro, back. They stay ready. <laughs> Like Jared broke, he would hit me like, man, I don't want to overwhelm you. Like he would send you a photo with like a hundred joints in, and it's just like, bro, like those dudes are animals, man. Love those dudes, and I really, I, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's crazy. I, I, I was like, are you, wait, did you just send me a Dropbox link? And then before the plane could take off, I like opened the Dropbox link, downloaded it, and I had like five songs written before the plane landed. Like it was just like, wow. who, who are who are y'all? And it's been a great friendship, great partnership since then. We've been working nonstop. And uh, they sent me the lessons track, which you got to think at that point, I'm not even, it's not on my radar to make another album. I just did hear from here. I'm not even like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of good. And we're kind of still in the whole pandemic. But I knew the record was like, this is a special track. This one is killing. And, uh, immediately immediately i was like yo can i have it like let me write a check for it whatever like what what's up with this track and he was like yo my bad i did send it out just in all transparency i sent it out mm-hmm. to like another artist first 
can we like just wait and see what they say first since I just sent it to them first. I didn't respect. I was like, no problem. That's no, listen, no problem. And then about three days later, they said, uh, we haven't heard back from them. So if you, if you still want it, shoot your shot. Oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Most definitely still want it. And I'm going down in the studio right now. Like I'm going down <laughs> to record it like before. To before, remove before, all doubt. Yeah, remove all doubt. And, and what happened was, that was interesting though, was when I went down there, now it's like two o'clock in the morning of my anniversary. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think yeah. if I wrote the track, if I wrote to the track the first day they gave it to me, I would wrote a different song. But I think when I went down there, you know, it's, it, oh, man, it's, it's my anniversary. Okay. Man, we're still in this pandemic. It's crazy. You know, lost a few friends and yo, me and my kids, is everybody healthy parents. I was like, you know, just started thinking just that while I'm just loading everything up. It was like, mm-hmm. I was just kind of thinking, you know, for me, I'm one who wants to figure out or who do I want to be in a song and try to define that person as much as possible and then just hit record. That's how, like, if, if I if I cut out all the things I don't have to say, there's only things left is this and then just make it rhyme and that's going to be your song. And that was it. And and it just happened. I like, I had a camera set up for something I think I did the day before in the room. And I was like, let's turn this on and let's hit record. God has a funny way of showing. And it was like, yeah, after that, it was like, and it was really like, let's transfer this to my phone, post it, go to bed. <laughs> And just go to bed. I wasn't even like thinking nothing of it and woke up at all. Hammer, right? <laughs> and woke up to like just what is go? What are you doing? What is this? This is crazy. Ah, you know. And it was like, oh, okay. Let's uh, might want to finish this. Let's we might want to finish this one up. <laughs> I, I want to get this one done. And I probably went. I probably went. I honestly, and I probably never said this before. I probably went to bed, kind of hesitant to post it because I was like. I didn't look at the beautiful beauty of like how transparent it was and how many people could relate to it. I almost was worried a little bit that it was kind of like a jab at like all the ex-girlfriends, which I didn't want it to be mm-hmm. like everyone who let me okay. down, let me to you. But it is true. I mean, guess what? Every failed record deal, every everything that happened in my life had to have happened for me to have the kids. To get I have. Here. Facts. You know what I mean? It wasn't really like a, you know, guess what? I had to do that for you to, for you to be where you at too. And uh, so, but I kind of, I think that was my last thought of the night was kind of like, maybe tomorrow I'll change that line. Cause that was a little, <laughs> a little heavy, you know, but then it was like, when I woke up the next day and I was like, this is my song. Oh, my song. And I was like, yeah, we're not changing that line. They just got to, yeah. just had to eat that one. <laughs> Unless, I mean, real rap. Nah, nah, man, that record. And I really admired the way, like, you know, you work the song and just like, you know, just campaigned it. And, you know, I, it was, it's the crazy thing. And me and you, we was laughing about this the other day on the phone when uh, uh, Jared uh, from uh, Anakin Innovator, he described us, he was like, yeah, working with y'all, man. He was like, Arrow, he's a show pony, but you a racehorse. And I, was, <laughs> I was like, dude, that is so fucking, I'm like, I, Perfect that's, compliment. that's our dynamic. Yeah, that's, that's, like- that's our dynamic. That is our dynamic. <laughs> like Arrow, like he's going to show up. He's going to be dressed to the fucking nines. Like he's going to have the hat, like, you know, just, you know, and that was the thing I will say, I, I know just, I picked up from you just kind of, you know, going out on tour and just watching you, you know, everywhere you go, you always look like Eric Robeson. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You are always like dressed to the nines. It's always if 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 we at damn Chick-fil-A, you know what I'm saying? A show can break <laughs> out. I'm gonna be ready to give a show. And um, you know, and that was just something that was always you. With me, I'm just like, look, I'm showing up the day of the race. Show me who ass I'm beating. <laughs> I'm running my race, I'm beating y'all niggas ass, and I'm going home. I'm not staying after for autographs. I don't want to talk about the race. Like, I don't want to po- I did my job, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, so, but you know what's funny, even talking about that, they our shows, you're absolutely right. I got a hat on, a suit, a blazer at least, or something like that, and you have on a black hoodie, and a it hoodie. worked. <laughs> it worked. Right. It wasn't like, well, why he got a suit on? He got a hoodie. It it actually no. When you see the pictures, it works. It nah, that's like us. It, but it's like that. That might be the that might be the next album. Is like you know, the, <laughs> the show pony and the race horse. First of all, I do take offense. I gotta be a daggone pony. You know what I'm saying? Hey, that's all Jerry. Right, right, right. Why can't I be a thoroughbred or some shit? Why can't I be a some respect on my name? <laughs> but I think it's show pony. If that's what I need to be, I, I'll be it. But 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 once again, you talk about two. You know, three because Anakin and Vader is actually a three three man yes, production three. group. Absolutely. Um. Solid brothers, man. Solid, solid brothers. Life changing, man. Once again, you know, I we can go 
on here and talk about so many amazing people we talk about. And we're going to miss so many names. And I apologize because I work with so many great people. But definitely, you know, meeting those guys, I it has has it's definitely made me better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely made me it's better. Likewise. Same and, here. Uh, um, and really dope. Yeah. Lastly, man, I wanted to um just touch on it because this is something that me and you, we talk about, you know, from time to time, but just like, you know, just for our listeners, just, man, I just wanted to talk about just, you know, how you balance just like, I mean, you have three boys, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I have two boys, my boys, I mean, they're, you know, older now, my boys are 21 and 16. So, you know, yeah. they, but, um, but you have like, you know, young kids and uh, I just wanted to, you know, talk to you about like, how do you, you know, balance, you know, being in business for yourself and, you know, being a husband, being a, a father and, and, and not just being a husband and father and just, like, I just pay for shit and, you know, go to my, to the basement, but, you know, actually being present, you know, in, you know, being present for your family in that way. Um, how do you manage that? You know, first, you know, it's funny, I, my whole theory on balance is different, right? Like the fact there's like, I don't, there's, there is no balance, right? <laughs> right. It's like, how do you balance it? Right. For me, I, we talk about the board process, right? So I practice this thing called process over product. Like everything is, is connected to the process. This very conversation we have right now, I can't worry about how many listeners we'll have or how in tune will people be, or was it a great interview or whatever? I can just be that, yo, I'm talking to my brother and how connected can I be in this conversation? Same way as songwriting, you know, it's probably strengthened through songwriting, strengthened through music. Every time I sit down to write a song, I can't think about the last song. I can't think about the successes or the failures. I can only think Man. about what I'm doing. Yo, that bro, that's so crazy you say that. That's the same thing. Like I take that, it was like my football coach in high school. He was like, you know, look, you gotta have a bad memory. He was like, yeah. he talk about quarterbacks. He was like, quarterback, you gotta have a bad memory to be a quarterback. You know yeah. what I'm saying? If you can't think about, if you fumbled on, on second down, Hey, look, bro, that shit over with. You know, you this you got another down. You know? But you also can't think about the touchdown. You right, can't think right. about it. You can't think <laughs> about either of it. You got to think about the play you're doing and just put all the confidence that it will work out, whether it will or will not. That's product, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the only play you got. It's the only play you got. This very second right now, this minute we talking right now, this is this is the only minute, <laughs> right? We the next minute ain't guaranteed in any form, fashion. <laughs> so why not just trust this minute that we in right now, right? Like enjoy the sixty seconds. So. For me now, process over product transfers to different things that how do I practice process over product with my marriage? How do I practice process and product over product in my as a parent, as with my friendships and whatever? So guess what? I mean, really, with our tour schedule, with our teaching schedule, with our studio schedule, with all that stuff like that, I mean, I respectfully can say that there's not enough time to to be the best friend to every friend I have to really be the best father, the best husband. I'm gonna try my best to be that. What it is, is really how connected can I be with you in the time that we have, right? Mm -hmm. So if I only have an hour in the studio, can I get lost in the studio for 59 minutes? I can't walk in the studio going, damn, I only got an hour, ah, right, I don't have no right. time. It's like, no, I'm gonna kill this hour I got in here. And the same, same thing was I go upstairs and I know I'm leaving on Friday, but you know, I can play with the kids all day today. Let's just get lost. Like how, how mm -hmm. much can I, I can't worry if you're gonna be a doctor or this and that, this and that. Um, what's crazy, literally from this pocket, just before I came in to do this podcast, um, my kids are on spring break and I was like, man, today, today's busy. Right. And then Wednesday's busy. And this, I, I looked at the schedule. So yesterday, like I was just telling my wife, I said, I'm just taking the kids. We're going to Poconos. So <laughs> I just grabbed them, threw them in the car and we just balled out for like 24 hours. Just went to a, went to a water park and just kids stayed up to like four o'clock in the morning, got up, That's got, so went crazy. back in the water, literally got out the water, put clothes on and drove back here just to get on this microphone and talk, talk with you. And it's like, yo, guess what? We only had 24 hours, but guess what? We just going all out for 24 hours and that's balance is how much can you be in tune with what time you have right so if yeah i no nah, i i no i i've completely relate to that i i kind of look at it like you know to your point when people think of balance they think of just like oh i have the exact amount of time to do this and the exact amount of time to do this. to me in, in my career balance has always kind of been more so an oscillation between two extremes right exactly. so like when I'm locked in the studio, like like when we was Tigalero, right? It's like, okay, I'm locked in. I just have to, it's, it's it, the word that just comes to my mind always is just surrender. Like, yeah. I just have to just surrender. It's like, bro, this is not gonna make no sense. I'm about to be up for like, you know, 
36 hours i'm about to like my sleep schedule about to be shit i'm about to eat like shit for like a month <laughs> like you just know it's just like there's no right like if you try to make sense of this shit you're lost so right. you just got to give in but then once the record is done and once the work is done now for the next you know month for the next two months i'm just playing ps5 and that's it you know what i mean exactly so and you kind of have those you know those kind of two extremes and that has been the closest I've been able, you know, to get to balance, you know, that makes, you know, the most sense for my life. But I've always been curious as to how you you manage it with all the things you have going on. What, I, what I'll tell you is that music, and I say art in general, is the most selfish thing I've ever seen in my life. Music wants mm. everything out of you. It wants to Bruh. pull everything. It wants all your time. In a moment that, like... And it will test you in every oh way. Oh, my God. Like... <laughs> You, you already know. You, we we had this. Guess what? The Bruh. biggest the biggest show offer you're gonna have every year is your kids on your kid's birthday. The Listen. big you know a promoter's gonna call you with that bag of bags. <laughs> that's gonna be on your kid's birthday on your anniversary. You know, or some or shit. All your like, anniversary, is, right, right. right, right. You know, it's like you know our wives already accept Valentine's Day. Go get that money. Go get that. Right, right, short, right, right, right. But like, why does the show always have to land on their birthday, right? Yeah. Or Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, like any of those. Yeah. yeah, it's like, but that's the you test. Like, are you going to take it? Are you going to take the show? Are you, you know what I mean? And it's like, but that's, that's this, that's this craft. And it, and like, as soon as I'm supposed to turn the equipment off and go upstairs and kind of check in, here's the next Bruh. idea pops in your head. And you're like, oh my God, that's a crazy idea. And then you turn the equipment. So it's like, it is the most, but you know, Cause it's elusive. Like I think, like when you, you know, when you say like, cause I, bro, I feel you. Like when you' about to go to bed, and you know, Quincy Jones is like, we he talked, we had him on the show like years ago, and he was talking about just kind of that alpha state. You know, where he he calls the alpha state when your mind is just, you know, it's three four in the yeah. morning and you're not thinking, you're just yep. doing, you're just doing. existing, and so it's like you know that four in the morning where you have that time, and it's like man, I really know, I know I got to get up and be in the carpool line in three hours, but <laughs> if I go to sleep, I could lose this moment and I'll never be able to recapture it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's just, it's that elusive thing that you're chasing. And so when you catch it, it's just like, yeah, it's like catching a fucking shooting star. You're like, man, I just got to hold on to this. You know what I mean? And keep some of this magic for myself. So you know, I'm going to tell you what's interesting. This is what I, I, I said, my whole view on creativity is different now. And I'm one now where I can, I can turn the equipment off in that moment. Right. And it's more because I'm at the realization now and I feel like truth be told, and I say this before I even say the statement, I feel like my pen is stronger than ever right now. Right. 100%. I feel like just, yeah. just my connection, whatever, but creativity is often some, it, we treat it like a best friend we don't deserve. Right. Hmm. So in a moment where we should turn the equipment off and go upstairs, it's like when it shows up, we're like, oh my God, you showed up. The hell with my wife, hell with my kid. <laughs> right, 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 right. Come, come, creativity. Come, come on in, come on in, have a seat, have a seat. What you, what you gotta tell me, what you gotta tell me? You know, and that's how I was like, I was probably that way for like the 75% of my life. Like I would, I would leave the Christmas table. I would leave in the middle of making love. Wow, wow. When an idea, idea pops in like, you know, soft as lips. I can say now, like soft as lips happened. Like the song, the idea of the song happened while kissing somebody. And I stopped. Wow. I remember like I stopped doing what I was doing to write the song, you know. And, I've never you know, been that devoted, Eric Rose. No, come on, you have to be that devoted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've watched you be that devoted, you know. But but what happens is like, yo, but we have to realize that creativity needs us just like it needs it, we, we need it. And like Quincy Jones was so worried over what, what, what was it? Was it Michael Jackson? Prince said he couldn't leave the creativity alone because he was worried they would go visit Michael Jackson, right? Mm -hmm. So oh we, yeah. Uh -huh. like, yeah, yeah. But I'm 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 satisfied with now telling creativity, I'm busy right now. Can you come back? That sounds crazy. Mm. That sounds crazy, but it's almost the same thing of like if it's you confidence. Call, it sounds it sounds like confidence. It's, but it's it, not just know. confidence, it's it's trust, right? So it's it's like, I'll give you the analogy of this. If you call me and I was like, let's say I'm in the middle of just like a super game with my kids right now. And you call me, it's like, yo, I need to rap with you a minute. I was like, yo, all right, hold up. Um, give me two seconds. I'm in this mm -hmm. crazy battle with my kids and this that we having fun, whatever, whatever. Or we in the pool. Let's say we in the pool. Matter of fact, give me a couple hours, I'm gonna call you back. You know what I mean? You're like, cool, cool. And then we I'm in the pool or whatever, whatever. And I call you back three hours later. 
And I'm like, yo, so what's up? And you're like, man, I can't even remember what I was, what I was <laughs> calling you about, <laughs> right, right. right? But I was like, oh, that's cool. But what you up to? Now, first of all, just knowing you and we friends and we have talked, we've chopped it up. We've had deep, deep conversations mm -hmm. because of who we are for each other. That next conversation might not be what you initially called what me about. One hundred percent. Guess what? It's going to be some whole it's other still going to be great. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is we go into it like the quarterback still thinking about the last touchdown, the last interception. So I'm so worried about like, oh, can you remember what you was going to tell me? I can't lose it. I can't <laughs> lose it. That we're not being natural. We're not treating creativity like it really. It just wants to be invited. It just want to kick it. You know what I mean? So it's like allow creativity to show up and be what it's going to be. And guess what? Sometimes it's going, we already know, listen, sometimes it's going to be great. Sometimes it's not. How many times have we written a song and thought it was, this is the one I'm buying my Bentley. I'm paying mm -hmm. off the house. And buy it's my crickets. mama house. All that. Right. It's and it's straight crickets, right? Off the most fire thing you thought you ever did. And it's straight crickets. And it has this one. And then the thing. one little thing you did on your phone, you put up on, on your IG phone and wake up the next morning. And that shit is you out thought of here. nothing of it. And now this is, <laughs> this is the joint that now you got to tour for two years. You can't never get off stage without saying, you know what I'm saying? So, so why are we prejudging creativity at the end of the day when it shows up and you have time for it, then treat it, treat it like it's supposed to be. And if you don't, then, then put the time in other, in other areas and, and going back to even the balance thing, my wife has to feel seen sometimes more than music. Understand. She has to feel like I chose music over her sometimes. My kids as well. My kids have, have literally been raised watching me in the studio. And sometimes they have to see me turn the equipment off for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so they, they have to, they have to see that. So you have to be there. And I have to trust that. Like, I feel like my music's gotten better. The more I've been like, nah, let me live. Oh man, because you got if you don't live, you ain't gonna have shit to write about. You no, like, what am I gonna sing about? Yeah, and it was you know, and for me, it was you know, when I, with your boys, you know, your boys are really young, you know what I'm saying? And for me, you know, my boy, I had you know kids like super young, and so it kind of worked out in a good way because when I was when they were young, and you know, they you know they really just wanted to be around their mama all the time, <laughs> so I was touring <laughs> and stuff, you know, what I mean, I was out really getting it. But then by the time they got the teenage years, that was when, you know, I kind of transitioned into FE, like we start our label. So I could actually be around for those years with like, they really it's like, okay, no, we need dad. Like, you, yeah. know, it's, you know what I'm saying? So it, it kind of worked out for me in that way. And I was I thankful to have that, but, um, but nah, man, that is, uh, that is really sage advice. I, the, the equipment for me, what has been my life saver, like that has saved me, you know, from stand up to the crack of dawn has been just having voice notes. Like I have, oh, yeah. I have a nigga, I have emancipation triple disc albums <laughs> <laughs> on my voice note. Cause I just have to just get it down. And if I can just get that down, I'll know to come back to it, but I have to have just some kind of bookmark and then I can cut the equipment off. But um, my, yeah. you know, our voice notes, if we dare shit, it's probably my biggest prize possession as well as just the notes in my phone. Well, I'll tell you, I, I don't write in the studio, but I'm always writing. Like, I'm always Same writing, here. like always staying, staying in shape because I think really we're just trying to find the inspiration like we know how to write songs so now i'm I'm just constantly collecting things that take my breath away you, somebody says a statement i go oh my god that's that's crazy right i'll just mm. document it somewhere see something and like how do i transfer that into words so i mean yeah it's like it's endless it's endless just collections and some of it i use and pull from and whatever but yeah we are constantly we're constantly able to collect but that does help like the fact that we can document a moment mm -hmm. Um, but then for me, like when I go in the studio, it's like how how like I said, like how locked in can I be, you know? And and then trust the product will work out. Like, you know, trust the product that it that it that it'll take care of. If I, if I stay focused on the process, the product will work itself out. I love it, man. Well, listen, Arrow, bro, man, this has been you know long time coming. Uh, I guess the conversation we need to have. I didn't think we'd be having it in front of thousands of strangers <laughs> on the fucking internet. But right. <laughs> but nonetheless, but uh, but nah, seriously, man, I, I just um, you know, I, I've told you this, you know, time and time again, but um, I just really just want to just thank you, you know, what I mean, for just really, uh, just showing up in in my life and in my career in a way that really, you know, for me, just showed me the importance of mentorship, you know, what I mean, and mm -hmm. you know, you really, 
um, just everything from the business to like the show presentation. Because I mean, I was like, I'm straight rap dude. So <laughs> going into R&B, I had no fucking clue what that was. I'm like, yo, what what is that? You know, and um, you definitely were a, a, a huge, you know, mentor and, and model and just, um, you know, big homie in the whole nine, man. And, um, you know, my my career would not be where it was, where it is, you know, without just your influence and just your guidance, just taking time just to holler at me whenever I had questions and just put me up on game. So um, nah, man, this conversation was a dream come true, brother. And I just wanted, you know, the world to hear this, you know, and just to hear your journey and, you know, really just, you know, give you that respect, man. 21 years doing this shit independently, bro. Hey, this shit will break big niggas with muscles. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this, shit, this, this shit ain't sweet, bro. So well, nah, man, I just want to just give you your flowers. Just thank you. I love you, man. I appreciate like, it, man. You know, it's been an honor and a pleasure. It's been an honor and a pleasure to watch your dream consistently come true. You know what I mean? I think one of the pleasures that I've had is watch a lot of people's dreams come true. And you by all, by all, not only being one of the most prolific people I know, one of the greatest voices I know. So the voice being utilized so in so many different ways. I, I can't tell you how proud I was just, just when you joined, when this Quest Love Supreme and you were on it, I was like, yo, this, first of all, you also are the most knowledgeable. I always say this, I, not, you're not hearing this for the first time. I've never ever told you of a record or a producer or a song that you did not know of already. <laughs> not one time have I ever. Yo, yo, it was what, yo, it was one time you got me and it was a big one too. It was the night we went, the night we did uh, Been In Love. Bro, I don't even know if I told you this. You were the first person to put me on to Todd Runger. Wow. Wow. Yeah, like, he was one of those artists I always saw his name and like I would see him. I knew his who he's associated with, but I didn't really know. And so then I think you played me. I saw the light and I was like, oh, my God, that's Todd Runger. Like I've been hearing that song forever. <laughs> wow. And you put me okay. on like the all we well, ran through the something anything album. That's one time. <laughs> that's one like the entire. I'm like this joint from 1972 b-side this record you're like oh that's such and such and that's what's they playing the cello on it no that's killer i'm like ah, oh my god here's this new indie artist i met for the bay area they're killing it they selling independent uh records in the flea market oh yeah that's such and such such yeah i got that's that record man. want me to link you up I'm I got like, you. Oh my god. how do you know all of this stuff is is really mind-blowing man i'm gonna just say this and i gotta say you know first of all you know you're my brother and i love you love you love you man, for real you are so true to your art you are so true to your craft to your friendship and to who the person that, who you are you know it's so funny you are the first person like to curse in front of my mom and she didn't even like hesitate what like you know, like, yo, you, you know listen you know you are a cursor, right? It is, it is, it is fine. It's, it's it happens from time MO. to time. <laughs> it's part of your mo. So you in like you know at that time my studio was in my parents' house, right? So when we did yeah. love with my parents, and just even with my dad, it wasn't like, oh, this is how he talked to me, and then this is how he talks to my mom and dad. It was like, no, this is how he talks, and whoever's around <laughs> wants to accept this and love him. And my parents loved you it wasn't like who this guy you brought in our house to this party it was like no we love fonte <laughs> bring him as many times as he wants but it was like it was what i remember watching like the dynamic you talking to like my parents and it was still the same way it was like the mfs and the n-word like it was all in there and i was like yo he really that's how he really he really fired off but it was but guess what it was like genuine there's love and there's like a genuineness behind it it ain't like I'm shock value, whatever. Like, yo, you just a true brother. You like for real, like for real, for real. Anyone who knows, you know, you're just a true brother. And it's like just mad. I got mad respect for you. You already know, like Likewise, you already man. know Come anytime on, you call, like, yo, I need you to break dance in this video or like <laughs> sing, this, sing this melody or this joint on his like just sing the background vocals on the joint you know i'm like all right let's let's do it man you and know likewise too and everybody be as a tickler too they're like when y'all doing it yet like we're gonna do it again. I'm I'm definitely I I no, I'm certain to do another one. We you know, it's just hopefully we can do it at a time where like people ain't dying and you having kids and right like yeah. you know we have more order in our life this time around. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, right. I'm looking forward to it. But I just need to let you know, man. I appreciate you having me on. And I, I love you, brother, and look forward to doing more with you. Love you too, bro. For real, man. On behalf of Unpaid Bill, Sugar Steve, uh um, Amir, Oscar winning Amir, uh, my work wife, Laia, 
Um, this has been Quest Love Supreme. I'm not Quest Love. Uh, I, I'm Fontiglo, <laughs> but um, <laughs> nah, man. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll catch y'all on the next go round. Tap in with Eric Robinson's the album Lessons out right now on all platforms. Go get it, and um, yeah, we'll catch y'all on the next. <laughs>